Hi. Chapter 2 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims is titled Our Relation to Ourselves. It's about a third of the book, and it begins with section 4. Let's take a look at this te the text of section 4 now. Schopenhauer writes, The mason employed on the building of a house may be quite ignorant of its general design, or at any rate, he may not keep it constantly in mind. So it is with man. In working through the days and hours of his life, he takes little thought of its character as a whole. And, and to me, this seems correct, right? We, we are not always aware, not always thinking about the overall trajectory of our life when we're going about the day-to-day -day -day business of life, we're focused on day-to-day -day affairs. It's only when we're especially philosophical or reflective that we actually turn our attention to what we are and what we are becoming with a very deliberate eye. Schopenhauer continues, if there is any merit or importance attaching to a man's career, if he lays himself out carefully for some special work, it is all the more necessary and advisable for him to turn his attention now and then to its plan, that is to say, the miniature sketch of its general outlines. Of course, to do that, he must have applied the maxim nothi seaton, that is, know thyself, the, great, the Greek proverb associated with the oracle at Delphi and with uh, the Socratic mission of philosophy. He must have made some little progress in the art of understanding himself. He must know what is his real, chief, and foremost object in life, what it is that he most wants in order to be happy. And then, after that, what occupies the second and third place in his thoughts, he must find out what, on the whole, his vocation really is. The part he has to play, his general relation to the world. If he maps out important work for himself on great lines, a glance at this miniature plan of his life will, more than anything else, stimulate, rouse, and ennoble him, urge him on to action, and keep him from false paths. So Schopenhauer here seems to be saying that to have in mind a kind of miniature vision of what your future is, what we might call a mission or a plan, is going to be uh, vital for keeping you on task, especially if you believe you have great work to do. He continues, Again, just as the traveler, on reaching a height, gets a connected view over the road he has taken, with its many turnings and windings, so it is only when we have completed a period in our life or approached the end of it altogether, that we recognize the true connection between all our actions, only then that we see the precise chain of cause and effect, and the exact value of all our efforts. For as long as we are actually engaged in the work of life, we always act in accordance with the nature of our character, under the influence of motive, and within the limits of our capacity, in a word, from beginning to end, under a law of necessity. At every moment we do just what appears to us right and proper. It is only afterwards, when we come to look back on the whole course of our life and its general result, that we see the why and the wherefore of it all. This is, this is kind of fascinating, because in a sense he's saying we should recollect that when we are making choices on a day-to-day -day basis, we are doing so under a fairly heavy weight of necessity, a uh, necessity of our own character. Most importantly, if I am a coward, then I will judge things as a coward judges them, and I will decide as a coward decides, within a fairly, fairly narrow range uh, of choices, I think. So it is the gradual changes in our character that we maybe effect over the course of a lifetime, over the course of a long period of time. That's what's going to make the overall difference in our character, but we don't enjoy as much unlimited freedom as we like to think when we're sort of planning out our entire lives. These things happen by very slow degrees. And then, of course, it's only at the kind of the hinge points of our life, the end of a relationship, the change of job, the place where we, we see one part of our life coming to an end or the whole of our life coming to an end, that we turn back like the traveler over the road that we have traveled, and we then we see it as a unity. We may not be able to see it as a unity on the way because we are so focused upon the thing directly in front of us. Schopenhauer continues. 
When we are actually doing some great deed or creating some immortal work, we are not conscious of it as such. We think only of satisfying present aims, of fulfilling the intentions we happen to have at the time, of doing the right thing at the moment. It is only when we come to view our life as, con as a connected whole that our character and capacities show themselves in their true light, and that we see how, in particular instances, some happy inspiration, as it were, led us to choose the only true path out of a thousand which might have brought us to ruin. It was our genius that guided us, a force felt in the affairs of the intellect as in those of the world, and working by its defect just in the same way in regard to evil and disaster. Kind of interesting closing of this section. Uh, when we're doing a great deed, think of Michelangelo painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Right? He's not thinking of the great deed of the, of the ceiling itself when he's doing it, he's thinking of getting this particular arm exactly correct or painting the next thing just right. That's what occupies his attention. It's only when we, in a sort of a philosophical mood or in a moment of reflection or at a hinge point in our life, look back upon our lives that we see the unity and the purpose of it. It's also then that we become aware of the kind of guiding spirit or genius that seemed to animate our personality, that seemed to bring us through the right choices or sometimes perhaps the wrong choices. Um, that seems to be the, uh, the kind of spiritual lesson and the moral lesson that Schopenhauer is giving us in this part. And anyway, that's the end of section four of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. We'll take a look at section five next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. Section 5 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims deals with the past, present, and future, and the attitude that the wise man should take towards each one of them. Let me share it with you. He writes, Another important element in the wise conduct of life is to preserve a proper proportion between our thought for the present and our thought for the future, in order not to spoil the one by paying over great attention to the other. Many live too much in the present, frivolous people, I mean, others too much in the future, ever anxious and full of care. It is seldom that a man holds the right balance between the two extremes. Those who strive and hope and live only in the future, always looking ahead and impatiently anticipating what is coming, as something which will make them happy when they get it, are, in spite of their very clever airs, exactly like those donkeys one sees in Italy, whose pace may be hurried by fixing a stick on their heads with a wisp of hay at the end of it. This is always just in front of them, and they keep on trying to get it. Such people are in a constant state of illusion as to their whole existence. They go on living ad interim until at last they die. So obviously this is a this is an error. This is a bad sort of life to live, where, where I'm always longing for the thing that's just out of reach, the thing that will be that will make me happy when I get it, the, the thing in the future, that promotion, that that completed uh, project or relationship. And this this is to live like a donkey. This is to live always sort of off balance, always moving forward until until finally you you die. You, you, this is not the proper balance between the present and the future. So Schopenhauer continues. Instead, therefore, of always thinking about our plans and anxiously looking to the future, or of giving ourselves up to regret for the past, we should never forget that the present is the only reality, the only certainty. That the future almost always turns out contrary to our expectations that the past, too, was very different from what we suppose it to have been. Right? There's an interesting kind of knowledge problem here, right? My memory is deceptive about the past. I remember it being better than it was, so I regret something that, that is not accurate. And my anticipations of the future are often faulty. So to the extent I project my desire and anxiety forward into the future, I'm also dealing with a kind of fuzzy, inaccurate picture. What I possess right now, 
right now in this moment with certainty is the present and my attitude toward the present. And that's where my, my peace of mind and my comfort should lie. Okay, back to Schopenhauer. Both the past and the future are, on the whole, of less consequence than we think. Distance, which makes objects look small to the outward eye, makes them look big to the eye of thought. The present alone is true and actual. It is the only time which possesses full reality, and our existence lies in it exclusively. Therefore, we should always be glad of it and give it the welcome it deserves, and enjoy every hour that is bearable by its freedom from pain and annoyance with a full consciousness of its value. And this, in, in a sense, I think what Schopenhauer is trying to do here is to, to add some de detail to put some flesh on the skeleton of the old proverb or cliche, carpe diem, seize the day. What does it mean to seize the day? What attitude does it mean that we should take towards uh, the regrets we have for the past and the hopes that we have for the future? Well, I think that's part of what this, this section is about. Okay, Schopenhauer again. We shall hardly be able to do this if we make a wry face over the failure of our hopes in the past or over our anxiety for the future. It is the height of folly to refuse the present hour of happiness or wantonly to spoil it by vexation at bygones or uneasiness about what is to come. There is a time, of course, for forethought, nay, even for repentance, but when it is over, let us think of what is past as of something to which we have said farewell, of necessity subduing our hearts. And here he quotes two lines in Greek from Homer's Iliad, which um, A.T. Murray, I looked these up, A.T. Murray translates as, Howbeit, these things will we let be as past and done for all our pain, curbing the heart in our breasts because we must. Samuel Butler renders these same lines, now, however, let it be, for it is over. If we have been angry, necessity has schooled our anger. Schopenhauer. And of the future, as of that which lies beyond our power, in the lap of the gods. And here he quotes another line from the Iliad, meaning roughly, these things lie in the lap of the gods, in the hands of the gods. But in regard to the present, let us remember Seneca's advice and live each day as if it were our whole life. Singulas dies, singulas vitas puta. Let us make it as agreeable as possible. It is the only real time we have. So some interesting reflections here on the, the, the nature of the past and the future. We think we should think about the past as necessity and as gone, no longer affecting our present, and we should think about the future as in the hands of powers beyond our control. Right? We, so I, 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 I don't regret the past. I don't feel anxious for the future. It seems to be the ideal that Schopenhauer is um, sketching out. The next paragraph contains, I think, some controversial advice. And here it is. Only those evils which are sure to come at a definite date have any right to disturb us and how few there are which fulfill this description. For evils are of two kinds. Either they are possible only, at most probable, or they are inevitable. And even in the case of evils which are sure to happen, the time at which they will happen is uncertain. A man who is always preparing for either class of evil will not have a moment of peace left him. So, if we are not to lose all comfort in life through the fear of evils, some of which are uncertain in themselves and others in the time at which they will occur, we should look upon the one kind as never likely to happen and the other as not likely to happen very soon. I've, I've presented this to a couple of friends and family members and they, they think it's bad advice, most of them. But it seems to me Schopenhauer here is sketching out three categories of evil. He says, there's the one category that has a right to disturb you, right? You, you, you're entirely justified in being anxious and worried and concerned about it and letting it disrupt your present happiness. But that is the kind that is certain to happen 
and at a definite date in the future, right? So say I've been drafted and I know I have to report for basic training on May 1st. Well, as May 1st approaches, there's a definite thing that's going to happen that will be bad for me, I'm saying, and it's at a definite date, right? There's no way of avoiding it, and there's the date is known as well. Well, Schopenhauer may say, you have my permission to be anxious about that. That's, that's one of those rare evils which is both certain and fixed in time. But by contrast, then, we can note virtually every other problem we have in our life, it's either uncertain that it will happen, or if it's certain that it will happen, it's not certain when it will happen. And either one of those seems to give us an area in which we can uh, postpone anxiety or ignore or minimize the anxiety. So treat, treat them as though they won't happen or as though they won't happen very soon. And, and we'll see, I think, in the next paragraph, this makes some sense. I, I think not as a way of completely blinding yourself to the necessity for, to prepare for future evils, but as a way of not allowing future evils, which have a certain, have a kind of uncertainty about them, to disrupt and to spoil your present peace of mind. Okay, there will be a time to confront them later when they are more imminent and when they are happening. That time is not right now when they are in a sort of an uncertain future at an uncertain time. Okay. Back to Schopenhauer. Now, the less our peace of mind is disturbed by fear, the more likely it is to be agitated by desire and expectation. This is the true meaning of that song of Goethe's, which is such a favorite with everyone, Ich hab mein Sack auf nix gestellt. And that's the first line of a poem by Goethe, meaning roughly, um, I have based my affair upon nothing, or my thoughts are on nothing fixed. It is only after a man has got rid of all pretension and taken refuge in mere unembellished existence that he is able to attain the peace of mind which is the foundation of human happiness. Peace of mind, that is something essential to any enjoyment of the present moment. And unless its separate moments are enjoyed, there is an end to life's happiness as a whole. We should always recollect that today comes only once and never returns. We fancy that it will come again tomorrow, but tomorrow is another day, which in turn comes once only. We are apt to forget that every day is an integral and therefore irreplaceable portion of life, and to look upon life as though it were a collective idea or a name which does not suffer if one of the individuals it covers is destroyed. So I think this paragraph, I think Schopenhauer is saying some things interesting, a little bit, a little bit uh, dangerous for us, maybe as, as 20th, 21st century Americans, to, to think of the, the song from Annie, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow, tomorrow is another day. These are all cliches that have come up in American popular culture since Schopenhauer wrote. But I do think here there is some value at the very end of this paragraph, right? We forget that each day is an integral and valuable part of our life. We tend to think of the days of our life as though they were ants in an anthill, right? I have a thousand of these, and if I waste 30 of them, it's not that big a deal. This is the opposite of the attitude we should be taking. We should be valuing each day uh, with, as Seneca said, as though it were the entirety of our lives. So to treat them as though they were a heap, any number of which could be subtracted as long as it doesn't get too big, without losing anything, is to miss the point. In a sense, the loss of any, any particular day is a, uh, a, a grievous loss for us and for our happiness. Um, this also, he refers here to the peace of mind, which I think was the point of his advice about avoidable or, or uncertain evils in the previous paragraph. Don't allow worrying about those kind of evils to disturb your peace of mind. Back to Schopenhauer. We should be more likely to appreciate and enjoy the present if, in those good days when we are well and strong, we did not fail to reflect how, in sickness and sorrow, every past hour that was free from pain and privation seemed in our memory so infinitely to be envied, as it were a lost paradise, or someone who was only, that, who was only then seen to have acted as a friend. Okay, so what's the advice here? When you are well, think back to when you were sick and how when you were sick, you looked back farther into the past at when you were well and said, oh, if only I'd enjoyed those days of health as much as I would like to enjoy health right now when I'm sick. 
Okay, so to think back on your past in this way. But we live through our days of happiness without noticing them. It is only when evil comes upon us that we wish them back. A thousand gay and pleasant hours are wasted in ill humor. We let them slip by unenjoyed and sigh for them in vain when the sky is overcast. I think here sometimes you may have friends who will tell you, you know, call your mom, you know, reconcile with your estranged brother, right? Tell your children you love them because you may not be able to in the future, quite unexpectedly. And if something terrible happens, you may say to yourself, if only last Thursday I had uh, called my dad, I had done whatever it was that I needed to do. Um, we don't want to live with last Thursdays like that as a regret on us. And, and so from the perspective of today, today is a potential last Thursday. Do today what will what you will not regret then in the future. Those present moments that are bearable, be they never so trite and common, passed by in indifference, or it may be impatiently pushed away, those are the moments we should honor, never failing to remember that the ebbing tide is even now hurrying them into the past, where memory will store them transfigured and shining with an imperishable light, in some aftertime, and above all when our days are evil, to raise the veil and present them as the object of our fondest regret. Okay. That's a fantastic line. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it again. I'm going to back up. He says, we should treasure the present moments that are bearable, even if they are trite and commonplace, never failing to remember that the ebbing tide is even now hurrying them into the past, where memory will store them transfigured and shining with an imperishable light. In some aftertime, and above all, when our days are evil, to raise the veil and present them as the object of our fondest regret. Okay, that, that's, a, that's some great writing by Schopenhauer, I think. And the, uh, the point here being that our memory will deceive us. Right? We, we have moments today we should honor the or even the ordinary pleasures of the present moment, provided it's free from pain. Remember Schopenhauer's insight about um, pain being the fundamental reality of life. If we are free from pain, we should enjoy and treasure this moment so, because it is slipping away into the past. And the trick of memory is to take our ordinary moments, to wrap them up in this kind of gilded light so that they look wonderful, and then to bring them back to our minds when we are sick or ill or dying so that we can then feel regret and, and our peace of mind be disturbed. So Schopenhauer's advice is to avoid that, avoid that trick of memory by living in the present moment in this particular way. This, that's the end of section five. Uh, we'll look at section six in the next video. Section six has a title, the title of section six is Limitation Always Makes for Happiness. We'll look at that next. Thanks for being with me reading through this book. I appreciate your watching today. Bye-bye. Section six of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims has a title, Limitation Always Makes for Happiness. And here's what Schopenhauer writes. We are happy in proportion as our range of vision, our sphere of work, our points of contact with the world are restricted and circumscribed. We are more likely to feel worried and anxious if these limits are wide, for it means that our cares, desires, and terrors are increased and intensified. That is why the blind are not so unhappy as we might be inclined to suppose. Otherwise, there would not be that gentle and almost serene expression of peace in their faces. Now, for the first paragraph, I'll leave aside the comment about the blind, I think just meant as illustration. Here we have a very Schopenhauerian theme, however. The more things we care about, the more sources of upset and misery there are in our lives. So, in general, in order to minimize misery and, and therefore maximize happiness, we should hold this number of things to the minimum level that we can. 
the more things we care about, the more we spread our mind out over the world, the more we extend ourself into the world, the more unhappy, the more miserable, and the more suffering we're going to, we're going to be. Schopenhauer continues. Another reason why limitation makes for happiness is that the second half of life proves even more dreary than the first. As the years wear on, the horizon of our aims and our points of contact with the world become more extended. In childhood, our horizon is limited to the narrowest sphere about us. In the youth, there is already a very considerable widening of our view, widening of our view. In manhood, it comprises the whole range of our activity, often stretching out over a very distant sphere, the care, for instance, of a state or a nation. In old age, it embraces posterity. Second paragraph, another very Schopenhauerian theme, but this one uh, kind of gloomy, especially for, for men my age. As we get older, we, uh, our happiness decreases, our misery increases. Why? Because the scope of the things we care about necessarily increases as we mature. When you're a child, you really care about your toys, your games, a few friends. As you get older, you extend your care more into the world. By the time you're an adult, you're caring about something that may take in, something as, as grand as politics and the fate of nations. By the time you're elderly, you're thinking about posterity. You're thinking about the world and generations that go beyond you. Your points of contact with the world are, are necessarily increased. I'm suggesting here a sort of, again, Schopenhauerian theme that life, the longer life goes on, the more, the more unhappy it is. He continues. But even in the affairs of the intellect, limitation is necessary, if we are to be happy. For the less the will is excited, the less we suffer. We have seen that suffering is something positive and that happiness is only a negative condition. To limit the sphere of outward activity is to relieve the will of external stimulus. To limit the sphere of our intellectual effort is to relieve the will of internal sources of excitement. Okay, I'll, I'll pause there in the middle of the paragraph. A rather interesting suggestion, right? We, if we limit our activity and our connection with the world, then there are fewer objects outside of us to excite the will and therefore disturb our tranquility. If we govern our intellectual life and our mind and our thoughts and our reading and contemplation, we can similarly reduce internal demands upon the will. So he continues the same paragraph. This latter kind of limitation is attended by the disadvantage that it opens the door to boredom, which is a direct source of countless sufferings. For to banish boredom, a man will have recourse to any means that may be handy, dissipation, society, extravagance, gaming, and drinking, and the like, which in their turn bring mischief, ruin, and misery in their train. Difficilis in otio quies. It is difficult to keep quiet if you have nothing to do. So, again, pausing in this paragraph, um, limit your mind, but uh, not at the cost of becoming bored, because boredom will then provoke you to grab on to whatever is near at hand. It might be interesting to connect this set of insights, this set of reflections, with Pascal's writing about diversion and about the phenomenon of boredom. Uh, Schopenhauer similarly sees it, sees it as a as a hazard, but not for the same reason. Schopenhauer continues, That limitation in the sphere of outward activity is conducive, nay, even necessary to human happiness, such as it is, may be seen in the fact that the only kind of poetry which depicts men in a happy state of life, idyllic poetry, I mean, always aims as an intrinsic part of its treatment at representing them in very simple and restricted circumstances. It is this feeling, too, which is at the bottom of the pleasure we take in what are called genre pictures. And I'll just comment that by pictures here, he plainly does not mean motion pictures. He's thinking of, of paintings, uh, engravings, and illustrations. But that when we wish to show people happy, we show them living simply, without many demands upon them. And we don't show uh, harried urbanites in art that's meant to calm our spirit. 
Final paragraph. Simplicity, therefore, as far as it can be attained, and even monotony in our manner of life, if it does not mean that we are bored, will contribute to happiness. Just because, under such circumstances, life, and consequently the burden which is the essential concomitant, concomitant of life, will be least felt. Our existence will glide on peacefully like a stream which no waves or whirlpools disturb. And it, perhaps that, that's the end of this section. It's perhaps worth commenting on this overall Schopenhauerian vision of life that is emerging, really, that life is no good, and the, the less of it we do, the better. Or uh, perhaps being a little bit more generous to Schopenhauer, um, life is a constant source of, of hazard, of, of potential misery. And so we ought to act in such a way as to protect ourselves, to insulate ourselves from those sources of misery as much as we can. Or to use a metaphor, um, if it is frigid outside, I, of course, will minimize the surface area of my skin that's exposed to the cold. I will huddle up in my sleeping bag. I will pull my, my hood close over my face. And Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer is saying, life is frigid in just that way. So minimize your surface area in action to re reduce external stimulation and internally in your mind, in your cares, in order to reduce internal stimulation of the will. So that's it for section six. Uh, simplicity always makes, I'm sorry, lim limitation always makes for happiness, Schopenhauer's discussion of simplicity of life. We'll take a look at section seven in the next video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. In section seven of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer writes, whether we are in a pleasant or painful state depends ultimately upon the kind of matter that pervades and engrosses our consciousness. In this respect, purely intellectual occupation for the mind that is capable of it will as a rule do much more in the way of happiness than any form of practical life with its constant alternations of success and failure, and all the shocks and torments it produces. So I'll pause here in the middle of this short section to note that Schopenhauer is here discussing the contrast, we might say, between the contemplative and the active life. And he is saying that uh, the contemplative life may be preferable, but not because it unites us to higher objects and gives us access to a sort of greater kind of intellectual pleasure, Rather, it's simply that it's, it's less variable. Intellectual life is more steady. It doesn't have the shocks and the ups and downs, the successes and failures of practical life. And so it might be more comparable to having, say, a wage income that is steady month after month, week after week, rather than working on commission, where you have great, great months sometimes and terrible months other times, great highs and great lows, and a lot of anxiety about a long run of lows, for example. So uh, perhaps Schopenhauer was suggesting that just as one might, uh, the kind of person that might prefer a steady wage, a steady salary position, may also prefer the intellectual life because it's, le it's less varied and therefore less upsetting to the, to the stability of the personality. Schopenhauer continues, but it must be confessed that for such occupation, a preeminent amount of intellectual capacity is necessary. You have to have certain intellectual gifts in order to pursue this kind of life. And in this connection, it may, all, may be noted that just as a life devoted to outward activity will distract and divert a man from study and also deprive him of that quiet concentration of mind, which is necessary for such work, that is intellectual work. So on the other hand, a long course of thought will make him more or less unfit for the noisy pursuits of real life. It is advisable, therefore, to suspend mental work for a while, if circumstances happen which demand any degree of energy in affairs of a practical nature. And that's the end of the section, with simply an observation that just as great devotion to the, the physical workings, the active life, may unfit a person for deep intellectual pursuits, excessive pursuit of the, intellect, of the intellectual uh, variety will deprive us of the kind of activity, energy, and skill that's needed for active life.
And so we, we ought to govern ourselves accordingly if we know that our circumstances will be such in the future as to demand it. So that's the end of Section 7 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. I hope you've enjoyed this video. We'll take a look at Section 8 in the next video. Take care. Bye. Hi. In Section 8 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer discusses the value of a reflection and self-examination. He writes, To live a life that shall be entirely prudent and discreet, and to draw from experience all the instruction it contains, it is requisite to be constantly thinking back, to make a kind of recapitulation of what we have done, of our impressions and sensations, and to compare our former with our present judgments, what we set before us and struggled to achieve with the actual result and satisfaction we have obtained. To do this is to get a repetition of the private lessons of experience, lessons which are given to everyone. So, first paragraph, a uh, recommendation of recapitulation, thinking back over, examining on a regular basis the experiences we've had and the lessons that we learned from them. So where he spoke in a previous section about our life gliding along like a stream, he's talking here about the, the element of uh, examining our memories and our past experiences in order to be deliberate about the way in which we live. Schopenhauer continues, Experience of the world may be looked upon as a kind of text to which reflection and knowledge form the commentary. Where there is a great deal of reflection and intellectual knowledge, and very little experience, the result is like those books which have on each page two lines of text to 40 lines of commentary. Okay, this would be the situation of people who, who do very little but reflect a lot upon what they do. And the suggestion may be here that this is not an advantageous situation. A great deal of experience with little reflection and scanty knowledge give us books like those of the Editio by Pontina, where there are no notes and much that is unintelligible. Okay, the suggestion here, the opposite problem. Much experience, no commentary, no reflection, no lessons learned. This also seems to be unsatisfactory. Next paragraph. The advice here given is on a par with a rule recommended by Pythagoras, to review every night before going to sleep what we have done during the day. To live at random in the hurly-burly of business or pleasure without ever reflecting upon the past, to go on, as it were, pulling cotton off the reel of life, is to have no clear idea of what we are about. And a man who lives in this state will have chaos in his emotions and certain confusion in his thoughts, as is soon manifest by the abrupt and fragmentary character of his conversation, which becomes a kind of mincemeat. A man will be all the more exposed to this fate in proportion as he lives a restless life in the world, amid a crowd of various impressions and with a correspondingly small amount of activity on the part of his own mind. So the problem here being that, uh, well, well, the recommendation going back to Pythagoras, one of the first philosophers, is to conduct a self-examination, an examination of conscience, a reflection upon one's activities and choices and events and emotions of the day. Why? In order to acquire a, a sort of minimal amount of self-possession. There are some people, Schopenhauer suggests here, who may go through life in the sort of busyness and hurly-burly of life, never pausing to do this, and so never, um, never possess anything more than a kind of fragmentary and temporary um, possession of themselves. Let's go on. And in this connection, it will be in place to observe that when events and circumstances which have influenced us pass away in the course of time, we are unable to bring back and renew the particular mood or state of feeling which they aroused in us. But we can remember what we were led to say and do in regard to them. And this forms, as it were, the result, expression, and measure of those events. We should therefore be careful to preserve the memory of our thoughts at important points in our life. And herein lies the great advantage of keeping a journal. 
And that's the end of this section. What is Schopenhauer telling us here? Uh, we ought to remember that we will never be able to relive the moment, to relive, he says, the mood, the state of feeling, the sort of subjective experience of a thing. But we can recollect and make a record of, for ourselves, our actions and our thoughts, our, we sort of put it to words, what we, what we did, what we went through. And this is the great value of a journal, is it gives us, the, it gives us access in later times to those uh, effects, those sort of offshoots of the, the subjective experience that we lived through. We can't live it again, but we can reflect upon it with the help of a journal. So that's the end of section eight of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. We'll take a look at the later sections in another video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. Section nine of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims is about self-sufficiency. It's a very long section, so this is going to be a long video. Um, Schopenhauer in this video talks about the relation between self-sufficiency and happiness and why this requires solitude, withdrawal from society, especially for the person with great natural gifts. He talks about the difference between natural differences and social differences that are imposed upon us. He goes on at great length about the evils of society and the empty souls who inhabit it. He gives a very good metaphor in the middle of this section uh, comparing society to a symphony of horns and the exceptional individual to a soloist on the stage. That's very good. Watch for that. And he ends with some reflections upon the value of old age for self-sufficiency and solitude and gives some advice to the young, to people who may feel the burden of society as he does, but don't yet have the consolation of old age to help them deal with it. So here's, here's what Schopenhauer writes in section 9. To be self-sufficient, to be all in all to oneself, to want for nothing, to be able to say, omnia mea mecum porto, that is, I carry all my things with me, that is assuredly the chief qualification for happiness. Hence Aristotle's remark, hi eudaimonia ton autarchon esti, to be happy means to be self-sufficient, cannot be too often repeated. It is, at bottom, the same thought as is present in that very well-turned sentence from Shem 4, which I have prefixed as a motto to this volume. Now, that sentence isn't in this copy, but I have found it elsewhere. It's, Le bonheur n'est pas chose essaie, il est très difficile de les trouver en nous, et impossible de les trouver ailleurs. Or, happiness is not an easy thing, it is very difficult to find it within us and impossible to find it elsewhere. Schopenhauer continues. For while a man cannot reckon with certainty upon anyone but himself, the burdens and disadvantages, the dangers and annoyances which arise from having to do with others are not only countless, but unavoidable. There is no more mistaken path to happiness than worldliness, revelry, high life. For the whole object of it is to transform our miserable existence into a succession of joys, delights, and pleasures, a process which cannot fail to result in disappointment and delusion. On a par, in this respect, with its obligato accompaniment, the interchange of lies. Footnote. As our body is concealed by the clothes we wear, so our mind is veiled in lies. The veil is always there, and it is only through it that we can sometimes guess at what a man really thinks, just as from his clothes we arrive at the general shape of his body. I think this is fascinating that Schopenhauer associates society with lies. It's a kind of a clothing or a veil which stands between us and every other person, and the truth that this is high living, revelry, the pursuit of pleasure, and um, social living, all of this involves us in lies, which presumably we can escape from by remaining self-sufficient in ourselves, by remaining solitary. Schopenhauer continues, All society necessarily involves, as the first condition of its existence, 
mutual accommodation and restraint on the part of its members. This means that the larger it is, the more insipid will be its tone. A man can be himself only so long as he is alone, and if he does not love solitude, he will not love freedom, for it is only when he is alone that he is really free. Constraint is always present in society, like a companion of whom there is no riddance, and in proportion to the greatness of a man's individuality, it will be hard for him to bear the sacrifices which all intercourse with others demands. Solitude will be welcomed or endured or avoided according as a man's personal value is large or small. The wretch feeling when he is alone the whole burden of his misery. The great intellect delighting in its greatness and everyone in short being just what he is. Fantastic paragraph there. The, the, uh, each person is most himself, most what he truly is, for good or for ill, when he is completely alone, when he doesn't lose himself in chatter, in, in social relation, and all of the lies that that involves. Okay. We would expect then that the wretched would be much more sociable, much more inclined to be sociable as a relief from their misery than the great man who would find going into society to be kind of a burden or a, a descent from the mountaintop to, to use a kind of Zarathustran term. So Schopenhauer continues. Further, if a man stands high in nature's lists, it is natural and inevitable that he should feel solitary. It will be an advantage to him if his surroundings do not interfere with this feeling. For if he has to see a great deal of other people who are not of like character with himself, they will exercise a disturbing influence upon him, adverse to his peace of mind. They will rob him, in fact, of himself and give him nothing to compensate for the loss. But while nature sets very wide differences between man and man in respect both of morality and of intellect, society disregards and effaces them or rather, it sets up artificial differences in their stead, gradations of rank and position, which are very often diametrically opposed to those which nature establishes. The result of this arrangement is to elevate those whom nature has placed low and to depress the few who stand high. These latter, then, usually withdraw from society, where as soon as it is at all numerous, vulgarity reigns supreme. Okay. I can kind of see where Nietzsche got some of these ideas from in Schopenhauer, yes. What offends a great intellect in society is the equality of rights, leading to equality of pretensions, which everyone enjoys, while at the same time, inequality of capacity means a corresponding disparity of social power. So-called good society recognizes every kind of claim but that of intellect, which is a contraband article, and people are expected to exhibit an unlimited amount of patience towards every form of folly and stupidity, perversity and dullness, whilst personal merit has to beg pardon, as it were, for being present or else conceal itself altogether. Intellectual superiority offends by its very existence without any desire to do so. The worst of what is called good society is not only that it offers us the companionship of people who are unable to win either our praise or our affection, but that it does not allow of our being that which we naturally are. It compels us for the sake of harmony to shrivel up or even alter our shape altogether. Intellectual conversation, whether grave or humorous, is only fit for intellectual society. It is downright abhorrent to ordinary people, to please whom it is absolutely necessary to be commonplace and dull. This demands an act of severe self-denial. We have to forfeit three-fourths of ourselves in order to become like other people. No doubt their company may be set down against our loss in this respect, but the more man is worth, 
the more he will find that what he gains does not cover what he loses, and that the balance is on the debit side of the account. For the people with whom he deals are generally bankrupt. That is to say, there is nothing to be got from their society which can compensate either for its boredom, annoyance, and disagreeableness, or for the self-denial which it renders necessary. Accordingly, most society is so constituted as to offer a good profit to anyone who will exchange it for solitude. That's a great paragraph, another great paragraph. Um, I love the line, what was this? People who are unable to win either our praise or our affection. It's a nice turn of phrase. And the image of having to conduct commerce at a loss, losing three-fourths of ourselves by entering society, or getting the compensation of people's company, but at the sacrifice of far, a far greater good of our own peace of mind, so that we are the loser in every social interchange. We, we lose money. The more we do, the more we lose. Okay, back to Schopenhauer. Nor is this all. By way of providing a substitute for real, I mean intellectual, superiority, which is seldom to be met with and intolerable when it is found, Society has capriciously adopted a false kind of superiority, conventional in its character, and resting upon arbitrary principles, a tradition, as it were, handed down in higher circles, and, like a password, subject to alteration. I refer to bon ton fashion. Whenever this kind of superiority comes into collision with the real kind, its weakness is manifest. Moreover, the presence of good tone means the absence of good sense. No man can be in perfect accord with anyone but himself, not even with a friend or the partner of his life. Differences of individuality and temperament are always bringing in some degree of discord, though it may be a very slight one. That genuine, profound peace of mind that perfect tranquility of soul, which, next to health, is the highest blessing the earth can give, is to be attained only in solitude, and, as a permanent mood, only in complete retirement. And then, if there is anything great and rich in the man's own self, his way of life is the happiest that may be found in this wretched world. Let me speak plainly. I love this Schopenhauer. Right? That's about as plain as we can possibly be. The only the, the best life is the solitary life. The best sort of overall station in life is to be completely retired from society and living by yourself. Then he says, let me speak plainly. To continue, let me speak plainly. However close the bond of friendship, love, marriage, a man ultimately looks to himself, to his own welfare alone at most to his child's too. The less necessity there is for you to come into contact with mankind in general, in the relations, whether of business or of personal intimacy, the better off you are. Loneliness and solitude have their evils, it is true. But if you cannot feel them all at once, you can at least see where they lie. On the other hand, society is insidious in this respect as in offering you what appears to be the pastime of pleasing social intercourse, it works great and often irreparable mischief. The young should early be trained to bear being left alone, for it is a source of happiness and peace of mind. There's the comparison here. Loneliness and solitude have their evils. They are bad, but you can see just where and how they're bad. You can prepare for it. The difficulty, he says, of society is that it is insidious, it lies, it insinuates itself, it promises you one thing and then secretly takes away from you something much more important. I can't imagine raising children on Schopenhauerian principles, teaching them to be left alone. Perhaps, perhaps it can be done. It follows from this that a man is best off if he be thrown upon his own resources and can be all in all to himself. And Cicero goes so far as to say that a man who is in this condition cannot fail to be very happy. Nemo potest non beatissimus esse 
qui est totus aptus excesse, quique in se uno ponit omnia, or no one can be more blessed than he who is entirely suitable for him from himself and who puts all things in himself. The more a man has in himself, the less others can be to him. The, that feeling of self-sufficiency, it is that which restrains those whose personal value is in itself great riches from such considerable sacrifices as are demanded by intercourse with the world, let alone then from actually practicing self-denial by going out of their way to seek it. Ordinary people are sociable and complacent just from the very opposite feeling. To bear others' company is easier for them than to bear their own. Moreover, respect is not paid in this world to that which has real merit. It is reserved for that which has none. So, retirement is at once a proof and a result of being distinguished by the possession of meritorious qualities. It will therefore show real wisdom on the part of anyone who is worth anything in himself to limit his requirements as may be necessary in order to preserve or extend his freedom. And, since a man must come into some relations with his fellow men, to admit them to his intimacy as little as possible. I have said that people are rendered sociable by their inability to endure solitude. That is to say, their own society. They become sick of themselves. It is this vacuity of soul which drives them to intercourse with others, to travels in foreign countries. Their mind is wanting in elasticity. It has no movement of its own, so that they try to give it some, by drink, for instance. How much drunkenness is due to this cause alone? They are always looking for some form of excitement of the strongest kind they can bear, the excitement of being with people of like nature with themselves, and if they fail in this, their mind sinks by its own weight, and they fall into a grievous lethargy. Footnote. It is a well-known fact that we can more easily bear up under evils which fall upon a great many people besides ourselves. As boredom seems to be an evil of this kind, people band together to offer it a common resistance. The love of life is at bottom only the fear of death, and, in the same way, the social impulse does not rest directly upon the love of society, but upon the fear of solitude. It is not alone the charm of being in others' company that we seek, it is the dreary oppression of being alone the monotony of their own consciousness that they would avoid. They will do anything to escape it, even tolerate bad companions and put up with the feeling of constraint which all society involves, in this case a very burdensome one. But if aversion to such society conquers the aversion to being alone, they become accustomed to solitude and hardened to its immediate effects. They no longer find solitude to be such a very bad thing and settle down comfortably to it without any hankering after society. And this partly because it is only indirectly that they need others' company and partly because they have become, acc become accustomed to the benefits of being alone. What a footnote, right? Boredom is one of those evils that falls on many people, so they band together to banish it but the true way out is to just to become hardened to the burdens of solitude so that you can bear up under it easily and avoid having to tranquilize yourself with the, uh, the hazards of society. Back to the main text. Such people, it may be said, possess only a small fraction of humanity in themselves, and it requires a great many of them put together to make up a fair amount of it to attain any degree of consciousness as men. A man, in the full sense of the word, a man par excellence, does not represent a fraction, but a whole number. He is complete in himself. Ordinary society is, in this respect, very like the kind of music to be obtained from an orchestra composed solely of Russian horns. Each horn has only one note, and the music is produced by each note coming in just at the right moment. 
in the monotonous sound of a single horn, you have a precise illustration of the effect of most people's minds. How often there seems to be only one thought there, and no room for any other. It is easy to see why people are so bored, and also why they are so sociable, why they like to go about in crowds, why mankind is so gregarious. It is the monotony of his own nature that makes a man find solitude intolerable. Omnis stultitia laborat fastidio sui. Rather, all folly suffers from self-loathing. Folly is truly its own burden. Put a great many men together, and you will get some result, some music from your horns. A man of intellect is like an artist who gives a concert without any help from anyone else, playing on a single instrument, a piano, say, which is a little orchestra in itself. Such a man is a little world in himself, and the effect produced by various instruments together, he produces single-handed, in the unity of his own consciousness. Like the piano, he has no place in a symphony. He is a soloist and performs by himself. In solitude it may be, or if in company with other instruments, only as a principle, or for setting the tone as in singing. However, those who are fond of society from time to time may profit by this simile and lay it down as a general rule that deficiency of quality in those we meet may be to some extent compensated by an increase in quantity. One man's company may be quite enough if he is clever, but where you have only ordinary people to deal with, it is advisable to have a great many of them so that some advantage may accrue by letting them all work together on the analogy of the horns, and may heaven grant you patience for your task. That's the image I mentioned earlier of the, the symphony of Russian horns, each only playing a single note. The music only comes from a combination of many of them when they're disciplined and, and each play only at the right time. To listen to a single Russian horn would be would drive you almost crazy, and that's actually the experience of people with those kind of Russian horn minds. They have only one idea and one note. It's intolerable for them to spend any amount of time just thinking their single idea. They have to go out into society. And then the, the man of genius, Schopenhauer says, the man of exceptional quality, uh, like a soloist who plays the piano, who produces the effect of the entire thing out of the unity of his own consciousness. So a, a, great, a great image and a great simile to consider. Um, and this suggestion that perhaps if you have to deal with ordinary people, maybe you just have to do with a lot of them. And you don't have to listen to any single one of them so much that it would drive you that it would drive you crazy. Back to Schopenhauer. That mental vacuity and barrenness of soul to which I have alluded is responsible for another misfortune. When men of the better class form a society for promoting some noble or ideal aim, the result almost always is that the innumerable mob of humanity comes crowding in too as it always does everywhere, like vermin, their object being to try and get rid of boredom or some other defect of their nature. And anything that will effect that, they seize upon at once, without the slightest discrimination. Some of them will slip into that society or push themselves in, and then either soon destroy it altogether or alter it so much that in the end it comes to have a purpose the exact opposite of that which it had at first. Maybe hear a kind of complaint about the inability to keep certain elite institutions and societies elite. Everybody comes pushing in, wanting to relieve their own boredom, their own intolerable burden of their minds by getting a piece of the action. And the suggestion here is that people of quality simply cannot, uh, cannot keep, keep these people out. They're like vermin. They crowd in. Okay. Schopenhauer continues. This is not the only point of view from which the social impulse may be regarded. On cold days, people manage to get some warmth by crowding together, and you can warm your mind in the same way, by bringing it into contact with others. But a man who has a great deal of intellectual warmth in himself will stand no need of such resources. 
I have written a little fable illustrating this. It may be found elsewhere. And this, this is Schopenhauer's well-known parable of the porcupines. Right? Porcupines are prickly, so they get, but they're, in, they're cold. And so when they try to come together, they prick each other, so they move apart. They get cold again. And so they find that they have to stand just close enough together that they can warm each other with their body heat, but not so close that they stab each other with their, with their prickles. And he says that, that's a metaphor for society among human beings. We are uh, flinty and prickly, but we do need each other to some degree. This is a fable of the porcupines. Okay. okay, back to Schopenhauer. As a general rule, it may be said that a man's sociability stands very nearly in inverse ratio to his intellectual value. To say that so-and-so is very unsociable is almost tantamount to saying that he is a man of great capacity. Solitude is doubly advantageous to such a man. Firstly, it allows him to be with himself. And secondly, it prevents him being with others. An advantage of great moment for how much constraint, annoyance, and even danger there is in all intercourse with the world. Tout notre mal, says La Bruyere, vient de ne pouvoir être su. Or how all our trouble comes from not being able to be alone. It is really a very risky, nay, a fatal thing to be sociable, because it means contact with natures, the great majority of which are bad morally, and dull or perverse intellectually. To be unsociable is not to care about such people, and to have enough in oneself to dispense with the necessity of their company is a great piece of good fortune because almost all our sufferings spring from having to do with other people. And that destroys the peace of mind, which, I, which, as I have said, comes next after health in the elements of happiness. Very Schopenhauerian proverb there, all of our troubles come from having to do with other people. Yeah, sort of early uh, version of Sartre's uh, hell is other people, right? That's quite... This man's believing it and living it, says philosophy. Hell is other people. Peace of mind is impossible without a considerable amount of solitude. The cynics renounced all private property in order to attain the bliss of having nothing to trouble them. And to renounce society with the same object is the wisest thing a man can do. Bernardine de Saint-Pierre has the very excellent and pertinent remark that to be sparing in regard to food is a means of health, in regard to society, a means of tranquility. La diète d'Allemagne nous rend blessante du corps et celle des hommes la tranquillité de l'âme. Um, the diet of food restores the health of the body, and that of men, the tranquility of the soul. To be soon on friendly or even affectionate terms with solitude is like winning a gold mine. But this is not something which everybody can do. The prime reason for social intercourse is mutual need. And as soon as that is satisfied, boredom drives people together once more. If it were not for these two reasons, a man would probably elect to remain alone, if only because solitude is the sole condition of life which gives full play to that feeling of exclusive importance which every man has in his own eyes as if he were the only person in the world. A feeling which, in the throng and press of real life, soon shrivels up to nothing, getting at every step a painful demontee, a diminishment, denial. From this point of view, it may be said that solitude is the original and natural state of man, where, like another Adam, he is as happy as his nature will allow an interesting suggestion that Adam, solitary Adam, prior to the creation of Eve, is the sort of ideal perfection of the human race. He goes on. But still, had Adam no father or mother? There is another sense in which solitude is not the natural state, for at his entrance into the world, a man finds himself with parents, brothers, sisters, that is to say, in society and not alone. Accordingly, it cannot be said that the love of solitude is an original characteristic of human nature. It is rather the result of experience and reflection, 
and these, in their turn, depend upon the development of intellectual power and increase with the years. Speaking generally, sociability stands in inverse ratio with age. A little child raises a piteous cry of fright if it is left alone for only a few minutes, and later on to be shut up by itself is a great punishment. Young people soon get on very friendly terms with one another, and it is only the few among them of any nobility of mind who are glad now and then to be alone. But to spend the whole day thus would be disagreeable. A grown-up man can easily do it. It is little trouble to him to be much alone, and it becomes less and less trouble as he advances in years. An old man who has outlived all his friends and is either indifferent or dead to the pleasures of life is in his proper element in solitude. And in individual cases, the special tendency to retirement and seclusion will always be in direct proportion to intellectual capacity. So it seems like Schopenhauer is telling us here a couple of things are inversely proportional to our sociability, our age, and our intellectual capacity. Both our sociability goes down as each of those rises. For this tendency is not, as I have said, a purely natural one. It does not come into existence as a direct need of human nature. It is rather the effect of the experience we go through, the product of reflection, upon what our needs really are. Proceeding more especially from the insight we attain into the wretched stuff of which most people are made, whether you look at their morals or their intellects. The worst of it all is that in the individual, moral and intellectual shortcomings are closely connected and play into each other's hands so that all manner of disagreeable results are obtained, which make intercourse with most people not only unpleasant, but intolerable. Hence, though the world contains many things which are thoroughly bad, the worst thing in it is society. Even Voltaire, that sociable Frenchman, was obliged to admit that there are everywhere crowds of people not worth talking to. La terre est couverte de gants qui ne méritent pas que l'on le parle. The earth is covered with people who don't deserve to be spoken to. And Petrarch gives a similar reason for wishing to be alone, that tender spirit so strong and constant in his love of seclusion, the streams, the plains, and woods know well, he says, how he has tried to escape the perverse and stupid people who have missed the way to heaven. Cercato o sempre solitaria vita, le rive, le il sano e le campagna e i boschi per fuggir quest ingegni storti e loci c'è la strada del ciel ano smarita. That's, uh, that is... I have always sought a solitary life, the banks know it, and the countryside in the woods, to escape these crooked and shady minds that have lost the road to heaven. Schopenhauer continues. He pursues the same strain in that delightful book of his, De Vita Solitaria, which seems to have given Zimmermann the idea of his celebrated work on solitude. It is the secondary and indirect character of the love of seclusion to which Chamfort alludes in the following passage, couched in his sarcastic vein. On dit quelquefois d'un homme qui vit seul et n'aime pas la société. C'est souvent comme si on disait d'un homme qu'il n'aime pas la promenade sous le prétexte qu'il ne se promenait pas volontiers le soir dans la forêt de Bondy. That is... Uh, it is sometimes said of a man who lives alone that he does not like society. It's often like saying of a man that he doesn't like walking under the pretext that he doesn't enjoy walking in the evening in the Bondi forest. Schopenhauer again. You will find a similar sentiment expressed by the Persian poet Sadi in his Garden of Roses. Since that time, he says, we have taken leave of society, preferring the path of seclusion, for there is safety. In solitude. Angelus Silesius, a very gentle and Christian writer, confesses to the same feeling in his own mythical language. Herod, he says, 
is the common enemy. And when, as with Joseph, God warns us of danger, we fly from the world to solitude, Bethlehem to Egypt, or else suffering and death await us. Erodis ist ein Feind, der Josef de Verstand, dem Magda Gott de Gefahr im Traum in Geist bekannt, die Welt ist Bethlehem, Ägyptien, Einsamkeit, fleuk meine Seele, fleuk, sonst stirbest du vor Lied. Or for Leid, sorry. That's uh, roughly, um, I, hmm. Herod is the enemy to Joseph's mind. To him, God made known the danger in a dream, in spirit. The world is Bethlehem, Egypt, solitude. Fly, my soul, fly, otherwise you will die of suffering. Schopenhauer again. More, well, just a long list of examples here, obviously. Here's another one. Giordano Bruno also declares himself a friend of seclusion. Tanti uomini, he says, che in terra ane voluto gustare vita celeste, di sera con una voce, ecce elongavi fugiens et mansi in solitudine. Many men who on earth wanted to taste heavenly life said with one voice, Behold, I fled away and remained in the desert. Those who in this world have desired a foretaste of divine life have always proclaimed with one voice, Lo, then would I wander far off, I would lodge in the wilderness. That's a quote from Psalms, from uh, Psalm 55. And in the work from which I've already quoted, Sadi says to himself, In disgust with my friends at Damascus, I withdrew into the desert about Jerusalem to seek the society of the beasts of the field. In short, the same thing has been said by all whom Prometheus has formed out of better clay. What pleasure could they find in the company of people with whom their only common ground is just what is lowest and least noble in their own nature, the part of them that is commonplace, trivial, and vulgar? What do they want with people who cannot rise to a higher level, and for whom nothing remains but to drag others down to theirs? For this is what they aim at. It is an aristocratic feeling that is at the bottom of this propensity to seclusion and solitude. Rascals are always sociable. More's the pity. And the chief sign that a man has any nobility in his character is the little pleasure he takes in others' company. He prefers solitude more and more, and in the course of time comes to see that, with few exceptions, the world offers no choice beyond solitude on one side and vulgarity on the other. This may sound a hard thing to say, but even Angelus Silesius, with all his Christian feelings of for gentleness and love, was obliged to admit the truth of it. However painful solitude may be, he says, be careful not to be vulgar, for then you may find a desert everywhere. Die Einsamkeit ist noch, doch sei nur nicht gemein, so kannst du überall in einer Wüste sein. That is, um, loneliness is necessary, just don't be mean, so, so, so you can be anywhere in a desert. So, in other words, to, to the cruel and vulgar, the desert is within them. It is natural for great minds, the true teachers of humanity, to care little about the constant company of others, just as little as the schoolmaster cares for enjoining the gambols of the noisy crowd of boys which surrounds him. The mission of these great minds is to guide mankind over the sea of error to the haven of truth, to draw it forth from the dark abysses of a barbarous vulgarity up into the light of culture and refinement. Men of great intellect live in the world without really belonging to it. And so, from their earliest years, they feel that there is a perceptible difference between them and other people. But it is only gradually, with the lapse of years, that they come to a clear understanding of their position. Their intellectual isolation is then reinforced by actual seclusion in their manner of life. They let no one approach who is not, in some degree, emancipated from the prevailing vulgarity. From what has been said, it is obvious that the love of solitude is not a direct original impulse in human nature, but rather something secondary and of gradual growth. 
it is the more distinguishing feature of noble minds, developed not without some conquest of natural desires, and now and then in actual opposition to the promptings of Mephistopheles, bidding you exchange a morose and soul-destroying solitude for life amongst men, for society. Even the worst, he says, will give a sense of human fellowship. Hör auf mit deinem Gram zu spielen, der wie eine Geier dir am Leben frisst, die schlechteste Gesellschaft lässt dich fühlen, dass du ein Mensch mit Menschen bist. That is, stop playing with your grief, who like a vulture eats your life. The worst company makes you feel that you are a person with people, a man among men. To be alone is the fate of all great minds, a fate deplored at times, but still always chosen as the less grievous of two evils. As the years increase, it always becomes easier to say, dare to be wise, sapere aude. And after 60, the inclination to be alone grows into a kind of real natural instinct. For at that age, everything combines in favor of it. The strongest impulse, the love of a woman's society, has little or no effect. It is the sexless condition of old age which lays the foundation of a certain self-sufficiency, and that gradually absorbs all desire for others' company. A thousand illusions and follies are overcome. The active years of life are in most cases gone. A man has no more expectations or plans or intentions. The generation to which he belonged has passed away, and a new race has sprung up which looks upon him as essentially outside its sphere of activity. And then the years pass more quickly as we become older, and we want to devote our remaining time to the intellectual rather than to the practical side of life. For, provided that the mind retains its faculties, the amount of knowledge and experience we have acquired, together with the facility we have gained in the use of our powers, makes it then, more than ever, easy and interesting to us to pursue the study of any subject. A thousand things become clear which were formerly enveloped in obscurity, and results are obtained which give a feeling of difficulties overcome. From long experience of men, we cease to expect much from them. We find that, on the whole, people do not gain by a nearer acquaintance, and that, apart from a few rare and fortunate exceptions, we have come across none but defective specimens of human nature, which it is advisable to leave in peace. We are no more subject to the ordinary illusions of life, and, as in individual instances, we soon see what a man is made of, we seldom feel any inclination to come into closer relations with him. Finally, isolation, our own society, has become a habit, as it were, a second nature with us more especially if we have been on friendly terms with it from our youth up. The love of solitude, which was formerly indulged only at the expense of our desire for society, has now come to be the simple quality of our natural disposition, the element proper to our life as water to a fish. This is why anyone who possesses a unique individuality, unlike others, and therefore necessarily isolated, feels that, as he becomes older, his position is no longer so burdensome as when he was young. Okay. Quite obviously here, a kind of self-portrait of Schopenhauer, right? All the advantages that come with old age, the diminution of the passions, the, um, the ease with which one can pick up new subjects, having sort of one's full powers and experience at one's disposal, with fewer demands upon one and that kind of already alienated from and outside of young men's active society. He continues, For, as a matter of fact, this very genuine privilege of old age is one which can be enjoyed only if a man is possessed of a certain amount of intellect. It will be appreciated most of all where there is real mental power, but in some degree by everyone. It is only people of very barren and vulgar nature who will be just as sociable in their old age as they were in their youth but then they become troublesome to a society to which they are no longer suited, and, at most, manage to be tolerated, whereas they were formerly in great request. There is another aspect of this inverse proportion between age and sociability. 
the way in which it conduces to education. The younger people are, the more in every respect they have to learn. And it is just in youth that nature provides a system of mutual education, so that mere intercourse with others at that time of life carries instruction with it. Human society, from this point of view, resembles a huge academy of learning on the Bell and Lancaster system. Opposed to the system of education by means of books and schools as something artificial and contrary to the institutions of nature. It is therefore a very suitable arrangement that, in his young days, a man should be, very diligent, should be a very diligent student at the place of learning provided by nature herself. Now I looked this up. The Bell and Lancaster method of schooling was a 19th century method for instructing children, especially the children of the poor. Children were grouped by ability, and there was, it was encouraged that older children should help to supervise and help to educate the younger ones. And so Schopenhauer's suggestion here is that this is what society is for the young. The young interact with each other, and by that very means, they learn. So it's appropriate somehow that nature has made the young people sociable, old people not so much. So he goes on. We're near the end of the section now. Here we go. But there is nothing in life which has not some drawback. Nihil est ab omni parte beatum, nothing is happy on every side. As Horace says, or in the words of an Indian proverb, no lotus without a stalk. Seclusion, which has so many advantages, also has its little annoyances and drawbacks, which are small, however, in comparison with those of society. Hence, anyone who is worth much in himself will get on better without other people than with them. But amongst the disadvantages of seclusion, there is one which is not so easy to see as the rest. It is this. When people remain indoors all day, they become physically very sensitive to atmospheric changes, so that every little draft is enough to make them ill. So with our temper. A long course of seclusion makes it so sensitive that the most trivial incidents, words, or even looks, are sufficient to disturb or to vex and offend us, little things which are unnoticed by those who live in the turmoil of life. Okay. In other words, uh, living alone has the disadvantage of making you sensitive. As you might become soft or sensitive to light uh, in your body, you become sensitive to minor annoyances. You snap at people. You might, might find it very, very vexing what would be sort of an ordinary price of social, of social interaction for people who are not solitary. So again, this seems to come directly from Schopenhauer's lived experience. He goes on. When you find human society disagreeable and feel yourself justified in flying to solitude, you may be so constituted as to be unable to bear the depression of it for any length of time, which will probably be the case if you are young. Let me advise you then to form the habit of taking some of your solitude with you into society, to learn to be to some extent alone, even though you are in company, not to say at once what you think, and on the other hand, not to attach too precise a meaning to what others say. Rather, not to expect much of them, either morally or intellectually, and to strengthen yourself in the feeling of indifference to their opinion, which is the surest way of always practicing a praiseworthy toleration. If you do that, you will not live so much with other people though you may appear to move amongst them, your relation to them will be of a purely objective character. This precaution will keep you from too close contact with society and therefore secure you against being contaminated or even outraged by it. Footnote. This restricted or, as it were, entrenched kind of sociability has been dramatically illustrated in a play, well worth reading, of Moritins, entitled El Café o sea la Comedia Nuova, the café, or the new comedy, chiefly by one of the characters, Don Pedro, and especially in the second and third scenes of the first act. Back to the main text. Society is, in this respect, like a fire. The wise man warming himself at a proper distance from it, not coming too close, like the fool, who, on getting scorched, runs away and shivers in solitude, loud in his complaint that the fire burns. That's the end of section nine. 
a really interesting set of reflections upon and uh, maybe kind of autobiographical sketches as well as life advice from Schopenhauer about self-sufficiency, solitude, its advantages, and ending there with some advice to the young. I hope that you enjoyed it. That is all for section 9. The next video will be about section 10. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. Section 10 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims is about envy. Let's take a look. Envy is natural to man, and still it is at once a vice and a source of misery. Footnote. Envy shows how unhappy people are, and their constant attention to what others do and leave undone, and how much they are bored. Interesting connection here that uh, one of the troubles with envy is that it illustrates unhappiness, it illustrates obsession with or interest in the activities of others, which we maybe could do without if we were self-sufficient, and it, it shows we're bored. If we were busy and occupied and not bored, we should be less envious, the suggestion is. Back to the text. We should treat it as the enemy of our happiness and stifle it like an evil thought, envy that is. This is the advice given by Seneca. As he well puts it, we shall be pleased with what we have if we avoid the self-torture of comparing our own lot with some other and happier one. Nostra no sine comparazione delectant, nunquam erit felix quem torquebit felicior. Uh, I make that roughly, that says in Latin roughly what Schopenhauer just said. Um, our own pleases us if we do not compare it with the lot of another. Um, no one is happy to whom the happier person is torture. Okay, back to the text. And again, cum ad sperexis quot te antecedant cogita quot sequantur. If a great many people appear to be better off than yourself, think how many there are in a worse position. Um, in the Latin, uh, when you look at how many are ahead, think also of how many are behind. It is a fact that if a real calamity comes upon us, the most effective consolation, though it springs from the same source as envy, is just the thought of greater misfortunes than ours. And the next best is the society of those who we are in the same who are in the same ill luck as we, the partners of our sorrows. So an interesting observation here, and perhaps indicative of the, the practical nature of this work, that Schopenhauer says, even though it really amounts to doing somewhat of the same thing, we ought to avoid envying those above us by looking at our set, looking at the people below us, people who might envy us. This will neutralize our tendency to envy. He says that only the second best solution is to think of the solidarity we have with our companions in suffering. It seems interesting to me that he advises us first here to look, look down and then to look side to side. I, I might have suspected him to do it the other way around. So back to the text. So much for the envy which we may feel towards others. As regards the envy which we may excite in them, it should always be remembered that no form of hatred is so implacable as the hatred that comes from envy. And therefore, we should always carefully refrain from doing anything to rouse it. Nay, as with many another form of vice, it is better altogether to renounce any pleasure there may be in it because of the serious nature of its consequences. So part of the lesson here, I think, uh, as regards envy, we want to avoid at all costs being the object of envy in others. It doesn't give us any practical advice for avoiding it, but indicates that we ought, we ought to seek to avoid it in our relations with others. The second half of this section is about aristocracy and Aristotle, I'm sorry, Aristotle. Schopenhauer has some interesting things. The second half of this section is about aristocracy and Schopenhauer has some interesting things to say about it. Here we go. Aristocracies are of three kinds, one of birth and rank, two of wealth, and three of intellect. The last is really the most distinguished of the three, and its claim to occupy the first position comes to be recognized if it is only allowed time to work. So eminent a king as Frederick the Great admitted it, les hommes privilégiés rangent à l'égal des souverains, as he said to his chamberlain, when the latter expressed his surprise that Voltaire should have a seat at the table reserved for kings and princes, 
whilst ministers and generals were relegated to the chamberlain's table. Okay, so the French uh, privileged souls rank equal to sovereigns. The reply of the king, when indicating that an intellectual like Voltaire belongs at the belongs with royalty seated at the banquet, while uh, generals and government ministers, men of action, belong at, at a lower table. They don't deserve as much honor. Illustrating Schopenhauer's point here that the hierarchy of intellect will eventually be recognized given enough time. Every one of these aristocracies is surrounded by a host of envious persons. If you belong to one of them, they will be secretly embittered against you. And unless they are restrained by fear, they will always be anxious to let you understand that you are no better than they. Okay. Interesting. Every aristocracy subject to envy. Uh, envy is only restrained by fear. It is by their anxiety to let you know this that they betray how greatly they are conscious that the opposite is the truth. Yeah, so the envy connected here with lying and with, uh, with both self-deception and the sort of enforcement of lies against one's betters, uh, moving in kind of a direction that we picked up by Nietzsche here as well later on. The line of conduct to be pursued if you are exposed to envy is to keep the envious persons at a distance and as far as possible, avoid all contact with them so that there may be as a wide gulf fixed between you and them. And if this cannot be done, to bear their attacks with the greatest composure. In the latter case, the very thing that provokes the attack will also neutralize it. This is what appears to be generally done. Okay, so how does one react to envy and the attacks provoked by envy? By continuing to be better than the sniping uh, souls that attack you. Um, the same thing that provokes the attack will also neutralize it by continuing to be above it all, perhaps. The members of one of these aristocracies usually get on very well with those of another, and there is no call for envy between them because their special privileges effect an equipoise. Okay, that's the end of the section. And an interesting note, perhaps going in a direction also that might be picked up by Nietzsche later in his philosophy, that there is a kind of natural sympathy between members of different aristocracies, that they recognize and respect each other as men of quality, whether it's a higher, uh, an aristocracy of wealth, of birth and rank, or of intellect, suggesting there's a kind of harmony of the superior uh, that will, uh, against the envious and the sniping and the low. So those are Schopenhauer's thoughts on envy and aristocracy from section 10 of his Councils and Maxims. We'll look at section 11 next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. Section 11 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims deals with how we should make plans and how we should react to the failure of our plans. Here's what Schopenhauer writes. Give mature and repeated consideration to any plan before you proceed to carry it out. And even after you have thoroughly turned it over in your mind, make some concession to the incompetency of human judgment. For it may always happen that circumstances which cannot be investigated or foreseen will come in and upset the whole of your calculation. This is a reflection that will always influence the negative side of any balance, a kind of warning to refrain from unnecessary action in matters of importance. Quietat non movere. So the first lesson here seems to be that all of our plans may be upset by chance by unforeseen circumstances, and we should take this into account in our planning, including our planning for the most important things. Schopenhauer continues, but having once made up your mind and begun your work, you must let it run its course and abide the result, not worry yourself by fresh reflections on what is already accomplished or by a renewal of your scruples on the score of possible danger. Free your mind from the subject altogether and refuse to go into it again, secure in the thought that you gave it mature attention at the proper time. This is the same advice given by an Italian proverb, Negala bene e poi lascia la andare, which Goethe has translated thus, see well to your girths and then ride on boldly. Okay, the Italian I make out to be something like, uh, tie it up well and then let it go. 
In other words, don't second guess yourself. You take the you, you engage in planning and calculation at the appropriate time, and then proceed with the plan when the time for action comes. And don't get caught up in a um, a, a whirlpool of self uh, self doubt and second guessing. And if, notwithstanding that, you fail, it is because all human affairs are the sport of chance and error. Socrates, the wisest of men, needed the warning voice of his good genius, or daimonion, to enable him to do what was right in regard to his own personal affairs, or at any rate to avoid mistakes, which argues that the human intellect is incompetent for the purpose. Okay. Interesting observation, right? Socrates relied upon a divine advisor to secure his correct behavior, to avoid grievous mistakes, which suggests that Socrates' unaided reason would be completely unable to do so. And we can take that as a lesson. If the wisest man requires divine help to do well, we can't expect to, on our own power, uh, achieve great success and, uh, and wisdom. There is a saying, which is reported to have originated with one of the popes, that when misfortune happens to us, the blame of it, or at least, at least to some degree, attaches to ourselves. If this is not true absolutely and in every instance, it is certainly true in the great majority of cases. It even looks as if this truth had a great deal to do with the effort people make, as far as possible, to conceal their misfortunes and to put the best face they can upon them, for fear lest their misfortunes may show how much they are to blame. So in this final passage, it looks like Schopenhauer is telling us that uh, with this anonymous quote allegedly from a pope, that when things do go wrong for us, we bear at least part of the blame. And uh, that this is somewhat testified to by the fact that people try to avoid letting other people know that they are suffering and in misfortune. This is a kind of odd advice from a 21st century perspective. It strikes me as something we might not uh, hear with great pleasure. Although, uh, thinking about it now, I think to the degree it advises us to avoid, avoid completely externalizing the causes of our misery and our misfortune and our unhappiness, it certainly helps us to avoid a uh, complete loss of agency and blaming others, which I think is, uh, is, a, is a, an external directed uh, kind of reaction, which is very unhealthy and which leads to further unhappiness of a different kind. So that is uh, Schopenhauer's thoughts on planning and uh, reaction to failure from section 11 of Councils and Maxims. We'll look at section 12 next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. In section 12 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer advises us on how to deal with misfortunes that have already passed. It's just two paragraphs long. Here's the first one. In the case of a misfortune, which has already happened and therefore cannot be altered, you should not allow yourself to think that it might have been otherwise, still less that it might have been avoided by such and such means, for reflections of this kind will only add to your distress and make it intolerable, so that you will become a tormentor of yourself. And here he, he cites a long Greek word that I'm not going to try to pronounce. Uh, no doubt it means self-deprecator or self-tormentor. Self, uh, it is better to follow the example of King David, who, as long as his son lay on the bed of sickness, assailed Jehovah with unceasing supplications and entreaties for his recovery. But when he was dead, snapped his fingers and thought no more of it. If you are not lighthearted enough for that, you can take refuge in fatalism and have the great truth revealed to you that everything which happens is the result of necessity and therefore inevitable. So Schopenhauer is telling us here, obviously to, this sounds like actually like very good dad advice, right? The kind of advice your father might give you. If it's in the past, it's a misfortune, it can't be changed. Uh, don't waste your time thinking about alternate worlds where it's not the case. Uh, don't beat yourself up for what you might have done to avoid it. Like King David, if you're strong enough, like King David, um, try to change things for as long as you can. Once the misfortune is set in stone, accept it and move on. If you're not strong enough, the interesting, the, the, the second, the fallback position is to think of determinism and necessity. Take comfort in the fact that things could not have been other than, that, than the way that they are 
and you've already moved past a bit of the regret and beating yourself up over it to the position where you can begin to think about how to, um, how to accept it and move forward. Here's the second paragraph. However good this advice might be, it is one-sided and partial. In relieving and quieting us for the moment, it is no doubt effective enough. But when our misfortunes have resulted, as is usually the case, from our own carelessness or folly, or at any rate partly by our own fault, it is a good thing to consider how they might have been avoided, and to consider it often, in spite of its being a tender subject, a salutary form of self-discipline which will make us wiser and better men in the future. If we have made obvious mistakes, we should not try, as we generally do, to gloss them over or to find something to excuse or extenuate them. We should admit to ourselves that we have committed faults and open our eyes wide to all their enormity in order that we may firmly resolve to avoid them in time to come. To be sure, that means a great deal of self-inflicted pain in the shape of discontent, but it should be remembered that to spare the rod is to spoil the child. And here he quotes a Greek proverb from Menander that I'm, I've not been able to translate, but doubtless means the same thing. So that's the end of section 12. What is he telling us in this second paragraph? Uh, as good as it is to be able to be indifferent to misfortunes that you can't change and to ignore the alternate paths that you might beat yourself up for not having taken, um, if there is an error of yours that has contributed to the misfortune, it is worthwhile to cause yourself fairly significant psychological pain dwelling upon your contribution to it in order to impress upon yourself all the more deeply the need not to make that mistake again in the future. It seems to me good advice, and, and again, so kind of Schopenhauer in, in full dad mode here, giving advice to people who might uh, govern their minds poorly. So we use this kind of self-discipline to impress upon ourselves our own contribution to our misfortune so that we might avoid making such contributions in the future. This reminds me in a slight way of uh, Simone, uh, Simone Weil's observation in her essay on school studies that we ought to uh, contemplate our own wretchedness and impress upon ourselves our own inadequacy when we go over, say, a school exercise and realize that we've done it poorly. Weil has in mind a kind of spiritual benefit that I don't think Schopenhauer is thinking of, but I just thought I'd mention the connection. So that's it for section 12. We'll look at section 13 in the next video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. In section 13 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer gives us some advice for the governing of the imagination. This, passage, this chapter is about three and a half pages long, and Schopenhauer's writing is so clear here, I think I'll simply offer it to you with very little commentary. Schopenhauer writes, In all matters affecting our weal and or woe, we should be careful not to let our imagination run away with us and build no castles in the air. In the first place, they are expensive to build because we have to pull them down again immediately, and that is a source of grief. We should be still more on our guard against distressing our hearts by depicting possible misfortunes. If these were misfortunes of a purely imaginary kind, or very remote and unlikely, we should at once see, on awaking from our dream, that the whole thing was mere illusion. We should rejoice all the more in a reality better than our dreams, or at most be warned against misfortunes which, although very remote, were still possible. These, however, are not the sort of playthings in which imagination delights. It is only in idle hours that we build castles in the air, and they are always of a pleasing disposition a pleasing description. The matter which goes to form gloomy dreams are mischances, which to some extent really threaten us, though it be from some distance. Imagination makes them look larger and nearer and more terrible than they are in reality. This is a kind of dream which cannot be so readily shaken off on awaking as a pleasant one. For a pleasant dream is soon dispelled by reality, leaving at most a feeble hope lying in the lap of possibility. When we have abandoned ourselves to a fit of the blues, visions are conjured up which do not so easily vanish again. 
for it is always just possible that the visions may be realized. But we are not always able to estimate the exact degree of possibility. Possibility may easily pass into probability, and thus we deliver ourselves up to torture. Therefore, we should be careful not to be over-anxious on any matter affecting our weal or our woe, not to carry our anxiety to unreasonable or injudicious limits, but coolly and dispassionately to deliberate upon the matter, as though it were an abstract question which did not touch us in particular. We should give no play to imagination here, for imagination is not judgment. It only conjures up visions, inducing an unprofitable and often very painful mood. I'll pause here for a brief comment. Schopenhauer is advising us not to let our fantasies run away with us in either the positive or the negative direction. We shouldn't build castles in the air because they are so unrealistic. We'll find ourselves brought back to reality. But perhaps more importantly, we shouldn't let our imagination of negative things which might happen run away with us, either if they are extremely unlikely or even if they are remotely unlikely, but, uh, but still possible, these, these things haunt us. We conjure these up and then they, they, they are very difficult for us to get rid of. Better for us to leave them entirely uh, out of our mental life. And as he says, to uh, look on all of these possibilities from a completely abstract point of view, as though they, they were somebody else's fate that we were imagining. In this way, we avoid tormenting ourselves with imagined faults and imagined um, problems that may come up in the future. Schopenhauer continues. The rule on which I am here insisting should be most carefully observed towards evening. For as darkness makes us timid and apt to see terrifying shapes everywhere, there is something similar in the effect of indistinct thoughts. And uncertainty always brings with it a sense of danger. Hence, towards evening, when our powers of thought and judgment are relaxed, at the hour, as it were, of subjective darkness, the intellect becomes tired, easily confused, and unable to get at the bottom of things. And if in that state we meditate on matters of personal interest to ourselves, they soon assume a dangerous and terrifying aspect. This is mostly the case at night when we are in bed, for then the mind is fully relaxed and the power of judgment quite unequal to its duties. But imagination is still awake. Night gives a black look to everything, whatever it may be. This is why our thoughts just before we go to sleep or as we lie awake through the hours of the night are usually such confusions and perversions of facts as dreams themselves. And when our thoughts at that time are concentrated upon our own concerns, they are generally as black and monstrous as possible. In the morning, all such nightmares vanish like dreams. As the Spanish proverb has it, noche tinta blanco el día, the night is colored, the day is white. But even towards nightfall, as soon as the candles are lit, the mind, like the eye, no longer sees things so clearly as by day. It is a time unsuited to serious meditation especially on unpleasant subjects. The morning is the proper time for that, as indeed for all efforts without exception, whether mental or bodily. For the morning is the youth of the day when everything is bright, fresh, and easy of attainment. We feel strong then, and all our faculties are completely at our disposal. Do not shorten the morning by getting up late or waste it in unworthy occupations or in talk. Look upon it as the quintessence of life, as to a certain extent sacred. Evening is like old age. We are languid, talkative, silly. Each day is a little life, every waking and rising a little birth, every fresh morning a little youth, every going to rest and sleep a little death. We see here Schopenhauer, obviously a morning person, and recommending, on grounds that seem good to me, uh, saving our serious uh, thoughts and our serious work for the early hours of the morning when our powers of the mind are strongest, and especially avoiding this brooding over our problems when we lie awake in bed at night. That seems to track my experience pretty well. It seems like very good advice. Schopenhauer continues. 
But condition of health, sleep, nourishment, temperature, weather, surroundings, and much else that is purely external have in general an important influence upon our mood and therefore upon our thoughts. Hence, both our view of any matter and our capacity for any work are very much subject to time and place. So it is best to profit by a good mood, for how seldom it comes. Nimmt die gute Stimmung wahr, denn sie kommt so selten. He quotes Goethe here, uh, meaning, um, enjoy the good mood, enjoy your good moods, for they come so seldom. We are not always able to form new ideas about our surroundings or to command original thoughts. They come if they will and when they will. So too, we cannot always succeed in completely considering some personal matter at the precise time at which we have determined beforehand to consider it and just when we set ourselves to do so. For the peculiar train of thought which is favorable to it may suddenly become active without any special call being made upon it, and we may then follow it up with keen interest. In this way, reflection too chooses its own time. This reigning in of imagination which I am recommending will also forbid us to summon up the memory of past misfortune, to paint a dark picture of the injustice or harm that has been done us, the losses we have sustained, the insults, slights, and annoyances to which we have been exposed. For to do that is to rouse into fresh life all those hateful passions long laid asleep, the anger and resentment which disturb and pollute our nature. In an excellent parable, Proclus the Neoplatonist points out how in every town the mob dwells side by side with those who are rich and distinguished. So too, in every man, be he never so noble and dignified, there is in the depths of his nature a mob of low and vulgar desires which constitute him an animal. It will not do to let this mob revolt or even so much as peep forth from its hiding place. It is hideous of mien, and its rebel leaders are those flights of imagination which I have been describing. The smallest annoyance, whether it comes from our fellow men or from the things around us, may swell up into a monster of dreadful aspect, putting us at our wit's end, and all because we go on brooding over our troubles and painting them in the most glaring colors and on the largest scale. It is much better to take a very calm and prosaic view of what is disagreeable, for that is the easiest way of bearing it. If you hold small objects close to your eyes, you limit your field of vision and shut out the world. And in the same way, the people or the things which stand nearest, even though they are of the very smallest consequence, are apt to claim an amount of attention much beyond their due, occupying us disagreeably and leaving no room for serious thoughts and affairs of importance. We ought to work against this tendency. So that's the end of section 13 of Schopenhauer's Counsels and Maxims. I think it contains some excellent advice about governing our imagination, especially about avoiding, important for Schopenhauer, a pessimist, avoiding brooding over our misfortunes, painting them larger than life and allowing them to disturb our present equanimity. I think there's, there's a lot that's quite good in here, the idea that these flights of imagination are like the rebel leaders of the mob within us is I think a fantastic image and a very memorable one. I hope you've enjoyed this look at this part of Schopenhauer's Counsels and Maxims. We'll take a look at section 14 in another video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. In section 14 of Counsels and Maxims, Schopenhauer gives us some advice on how to govern our minds in order to avoid disappointment. Here's what he writes. The sight of things which do not belong to us is very apt to raise the thought, ah, if only that were mine, making us sensible of our privation. Instead of that, we should do better by more frequently putting to ourselves the opposite case, ah, if that were not mine. What I mean is that we should sometimes try to look upon our possessions in the light in which they would appear if we had lost them. 
whatever they may be, property, health, friends, a wife or child or someone else we love, our horse or our dog. It is usually only when we have lost them that we begin to find out their value. But if we come to look at things the way I recommend, we shall be doubly the gainers. We shall at once get more pleasure out of them than we did before, and we shall do everything in our power to prevent the loss of them. For instance, by not risking our property, or angering our friends, or exposing our wives to temptation, or being careless about our children's health, and so on. So I'll pause here for a comment. This is an interesting observation that Schopenhauer makes. He's noting that if, if we fantasize about having more than we have, if I have what I have and I think about what I don't have, I'm directing myself to a kind of illusory better world, which I'm contrasting with the world that I live in. What I ought to do is to reverse the order. To better appreciate what I have, I should speculate and think about what I don't have. I should think about the loss of what I have. What would I do if my wife were dead, if I lost my job? In doing this, he says, we will gain both in the sense that we will get more pleasure out of what we have, we'll be more grateful, and we will also sort of reinforce in ourselves the necessity of careful action to hold on to what we have because the loss of it is something we've just recently brought to mind. Schopenhauer continues, we often try to banish the gloom and despondency of the present by, speculate, by speculating upon our chances of success in the future, a process which leads us to invent a great many chimerical hopes. Every one of them contains the germ of illusion, and disappointment is inevitable when our hopes are shattered by the hard facts of life. Again, Schopenhauer is telling us, don't fantasize about a better world, fantasize or imagine a worse world than the one you live in, and you will avoid disappointment. And uh, as we'll see in the next paragraph, you'll have additional pleasures besides. Schopenhauer finishes this section by writing, it is less hurtful to take the chances of misfortune as a theme for speculation. Because in doing so, we provide ourselves at once with measures of precaution against it. I might say that by imagining what the loss of my wife and child or my job would be, I'm already thinking about how I would react and what steps I would take to prevent that loss. And a pleasant surprise when it fails to make its appearance. Okay, this is the meaning behind the, the quip that the pessimist has only pleasant surprises. When things don't turn out as badly as he expects, he is pleasantly surprised because the situation is better. Is it not a fact that we always feel a marked improvement in our spirits when we begin to get over a period of anxiety? I may go further and say that there is some use in occasionally looking upon terrible misfortunes such as might happen to us, as though they had actually happened. For then, the trivial reverses, which subsequently come in reality, are much easier to bear. So against the backdrop of the calamity that I've imagined and prepared myself for and steeled myself against, the minor reversals, the first world problems that I genuinely face in reality, are much easier for me to accept. It is a source of consolation to look back upon those great misfortunes which never happened. But in following out this rule, care must be taken not to neglect what I have said in the preceding section, that is in section 13, about the proper governance of the imagination. So overall here in section 14, some good advice from Schopenhauer about the right way to handle our imagination, our fantasy life, so to speak. Um, there's a bit of the bit of old proverbs that come to mind in thinking about this. You know, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Uh, thinking about the loss of what we have is going to be mentally healthier for us in appreciating what we have than being envious or speculating or fantasizing about what we might have. So that's a look at section 14 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. In section 15 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer discusses how we should organize our thoughts and our attention, and the kind of freedom that we will achieve by practicing self-control. Here's what he writes. 
the things which engage our attention, whether the, whether they are matters of business or ordinary events, are of such diverse kinds that, taken quite separately and in no fixed order or relation, they present a medley of the most glaring contrasts with nothing in common, except that they one and all affect us in particular. There must be a corresponding abruptness in the thoughts and anxieties which these various matters arouse in us if our thoughts are to be in keeping with their various subjects. I think what Schopenhauer is saying here is that the, the matters that occupy us in our daily life from moment to moment are quite various, and if we allow our thoughts to track each one as it comes up, we'll be jumping around from issue to issue without sufficient attention. This will be hazardous to our, to our happiness and peace of mind. He continues, Therefore, in setting about anything, the first step is to withdraw our attention from everything else. This will enable us to attend to each matter at its own time and to enjoy or put up with it quite apart from any thought of our remaining interests. Our thoughts must be arranged, as it were, in little drawers so that we may open one without disturbing any of the others. He's recommending here a kind of mental compartmentalization. He goes on. In this way, we can keep the heavy burden of anxiety from weighing upon us so much as to spoil the little pleasures of the present, or from robbing us of our rest. Otherwise, the consideration of one matter will interfere with every other, and attention to some important business may lead us to neglect many affairs which happen to be of less moment. It is most important for anyone who is capable of higher and nobler thoughts to keep his mind from being so completely engrossed with private affairs and vulgar troubles as to let them take up all his attention and crowd out worthier matter. For that is, in a very real sense, to lose sight of the true end of life. Propter vitam vivendi perdere causas. And that's a quote from Juvenal. That means roughly uh, to, to live in a way that destroys the reasons for living. To, to squander your life and merely to remain alive for a longer period of time. Of course, for this, as for so much else, self-control is necessary. Without it, we cannot manage ourselves in the way I have described. And self-control may not appear so very difficult if we consider that every man has to submit to a, very, to a great deal a very severe control on the part of his surroundings, and that without it, no form of existence is possible. Further, a little self-control at the right moment may prevent much subsequent compulsion at the hands of others, just as a very small section of a circle close to the center may correspond to a part near the circumference a hundred times as large. Nothing will protect us from external compulsions so much as the control of ourselves. And as Seneca says, to submit yourself to reason is the way to make everything else submit to you. Si tibi vis omnia subjicere, te subjice rationi. If you want to subject all things to yourself, first subject yourself to reason. Self-control, too, is something which we have in our own power. And if the worst comes to the worst, and it touches us in a very sensitive part, we can always relax its severity. But other people will pay no regard to our feelings, if they have to use compulsion, and we shall be treated without pity or mercy. Therefore, it will be prudent to anticipate compulsion by self-control. That's the end of the section. What Schopenhauer here seems to be recommending is a kind of stoic principle of rational self-control. We are going to be limited and controlled and directed by others, but to the extent that we can head this off and minimize it by exercising some rational self-control early on, we are grasping the circle, so to speak, closer to the center, where a smaller restriction on our freedom by ourselves can prevent a much larger coercive action against us by others and by our circumstances. This by way of also sort of preserving our peace of mind and our equanimity as we try to go through the inevitable sufferings of life. 
So that's my commentary on section 15 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. We'll look at section 16 in the next video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Hi. Section 16 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims is very short. Here it is. We must set limits to our wishes, curb our desires, moderate our anger, always remembering that an individual can attain only an infinitesimal share in anything that is worth having, and that, on the other hand, everyone must incur many of the ills of life. In a word, we must bear and forbear, abstinere et sustinere, and if we fail to observe this rule, no position of wealth or power will prevent us from feeling wretched. This is what Horace means when he recommends us to study carefully and inquire diligently what will best promote a tranquil life, not to be always agitated by fruitless desires and fears and hopes for things which, after all, are not worth very much. And here Schopenhauer concludes by quoting four lines from a poem by Horace, the Roman poet, and I've brought it up here in the Loeb translation. Here it is. It means, Amidst all this, you must read and question the wise, how you may be able to pass your days in tranquility. Is greed ever penniless to drive and harass you, or fears and hopes about things that profit little? Interesting advice here. Schopenhauer recommends to us never to forget that even the best of our life will always be an infinitesimal share of the good and of pleasure, and that we will always have to bear with a certain amount of suffering, a certain amount of travail in our life. If we forget this, if we begin thinking that the good in our life will be tremendous, large, and overwhelming, if we think that it will continue to increase, if we have this sort of aspiration to achieve a great amount of good in our life and happiness and pleasure, we're setting ourselves up for misery. And we will, we, will ex we will forget that the pain and sadness in life will always be there, even in the best of lives. And he says, no amount of wealth or power will make you anything other than wretched if you've forgotten that one truth. And so his practical advice here is, very Schopenhauerian, set limits to your wishes, curb your desires, moderate your anger. We might say, don't aim at living a happy life, a pleasant life, aim at living a tranquil life. Aim at living a life in such a frame of mind that you can enjoy the pleasures that come, that you can take what good is there for you, that you can endure what you must without being upset and wretched by your sort of subjective expectations of what you hope to acquire. This may be the, the way in which philosophy is a gateway to peace for Schopenhauer. That's my commentary on section 16 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. We'll look at section 17 next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. Section 17 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims talks about the importance of making things, of overcoming resistance, of doing things, of being active for human happiness. In making these practical points, Schopenhauer touches on a couple of themes that I think would connect up with Pascal, looking backwards, and Nietzsche, looking forwards. Here's what Schopenhauer writes. Life consists in movement, says Aristotle, and he is obviously right. We exist physically because our organism is the seat of constant motion. And if we are to exist intellectually, it can only be by means of continual occupation. No matter with what, so long as it is some form of practical or mental activity. You may see that this is so by the way in which people who have no work or nothing to think about immediately begin to beat the devil's tattoo with their knuckles, or a stick, or anything that comes handy. The truth is that our nature is essentially restless in its character. We very soon get tired of having nothing to do. It is intolerable boredom. Okay, think here of what Pascal calls diversion. This impulse to activity should be regulated and some sort of method introduced into it, which of itself will enhance the satisfaction we obtain. Activity, 
doing something, if possible, creating something, at any rate, learning something. How fortunate it is that men cannot exist without that. A man wants to use his strength to see, if he can, what effect it will produce. And he will get the most complete satisfaction of this desire if he can make or construct something, be it a book or a basket. There is a direct pleasure in seeing work grow under one's hands day by day until at last it is finished. This is the pleasure attaching to a work of art or manuscript or even mere manual labor. And of course, the higher the work, the greater the pleasure it will give. I think here in this connection of an observation Aquinas makes somewhere about the value of making, uh, of actually creating something, creating music, creating some tangible object as an important element of happiness, of engaging with the real world and not getting locked up inside your mind. We can also see a connection here to Nietzsche in talking about the use of strength to overcome resistance as being part of what human nature is about. We are restless. We, we want to see, we want to exercise our will against the world that resists us and to see something emerge out of the, gradually out of that out of the activity of our will that itself is a great pleasure that's that's magnified by the order and method that we bring to it by our philosophical reflection and our planning and our psychological self-discipline schopenhauer continues from this point of view those are happiest of all who are conscious of the power to produce great works animated by some significant purpose. It gives a higher kind of interest, a sort of rare flavor, to the whole of their life, which, by its absence from the life of the ordinary man, makes it, in comparison, something very insipid. Okay, getting definite Nietzsche vibes here. For richly endowed natures, life and the world have a special interest beyond the mere everyday personal interest which so many others share, and something higher than that, a formal interest. It is from life and the world that they get the material for their works, and as soon as they are freed from the pressure of personal needs, it is the, to the diligent collection of material that they devote their whole existence. So with their intellect, it is to some extent a twofold character and devoted partly to the ordinary affairs of every day, those matters of will which are common to them and the rest of mankind, and partly to their peculiar work, the pure and objective contemplation of existence. And while on the stage of the world, most men play their little part and then pass away, the genius lives a double life, at once actor and spectator. Fascinating image here of the kind of elitism that Schopenhauer is imagining. The, the idea of the great man set, up, set apart from the ordinary run of men with whom he shares common daily needs, set apart by his awareness that he can do great deeds. He has this ability which, which he needs to cultivate and which he devotes his life to collecting the materials for, for cultivating and doing. Almost we've got the beginning of what, what Nietzsche will later call the pathos of distance that characterizes greatness in culture and in individuals, the kind of awareness of greater ability. And then as Schopenhauer says here, there's kind of double life that of, of the philosopher, the one who both acts in life, but then also is the spectator upon life, who engages is because he's able to, is engages in this higher and objective contemplation of existence, who, who seeks not just to survive and to live and to thrive in a material and, and biological sense, but to know the world as it truly is at, at a spiritual level. So, so something of the spiritual elitism that characterizes the, the Nietzschean overman uh, somewhat later. Let's continue with Schopenhauer then. Let everyone then do something according to the measure of his capacities. To have no regular work no set sphere of activity? What a miserable thing it is. How often long travels undertaken for pleasure make a man downright unhappy because the absence of anything that can be called occupation forces him, as it were, out of his right element. 
we might call that the misery of undirected leisure. Effort, struggles with difficulties, that is as natural to a man as grubbing in the ground is to a mole. To have all his wants satisfied is something intolerable, the feeling of stagnation which comes from pleasures that last too long. To overcome difficulties is to experience the full delight of existence, no matter where the obstacles are encountered, whether in the affairs of life, in commerce or business, or in mental effort, the spirit of inquiry that tries to master its subject. There is always something pleasurable in the struggle and the victory. And if a man has no opportunity to excite himself, he will do what he can to create one. And according to his individual bent, he will hunt or play cup and ball, or, led on by this unsuspected element in his nature, he will pick a quarrel with someone, or hatch a plot or intrigue, or take to swindling or rascally courses generally, all to put an end to a state of repose which is intolerable. As I have remarked, difficilis in otio quies, it is difficult to keep quiet if you have nothing to do. So that's the end of section 17. An interesting reflection here, both on the, the need to overcome difficulties, the full delight of existence of being alive is in overcoming difficulty. It's not in having all your desires satisfied. Happiness is not a kind of resting state that we achieve where we just sort of float on the pool with every, all of our needs met. Happiness, sort of, sort of the, the happiness of life, of living, is a matter of doing, of achieving, of overcoming. And that's the case both in the intellectual life and spiritual life and in the material and physical life. It's always a matter of making, of creating, of overcoming resistance, of overcoming entropy, we might say. Um, so maybe shades here also, we can connect this with, with an observation of Aristotle's that we might ask of any man, with what activity does he fill his leisure hours? To, to be at leisure, we know this from Joseph Pieper, to be at leisure is to engage in a certain kind of activity, a certain kind of valuable activity. It's not simply to be idle, as Schopenhauer suggests here, sort of as an early psychologist, this, this would be misery to, to anyone, and most especially to the kind of man who knows he has greatness in him, who, who could do more, who was driven to collect materials from life for the, for the creation of, for the realization of some grand project. So that's chapter 17, section 17 from chapter two of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. I hope you found my comments on it rewarding. We'll look at the next at section 18 next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. In section 18 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer warns us against the dangers of the misuse of the imagination. Here's what he writes. A man should avoid being led on by the phantoms of his imagination. This is not the same thing as to submit to the guidance of ideas clearly thought out. And yet, these are rules of life which most people pervert. If you examine closely into the circumstances which, in any deliberation, ultimately turn the scale in favor of some particular course, you will generally find the decision is influenced not by any clear arrangement of ideas leading to a formal judgment, but by some fanciful picture which seems to stand for one of the alternatives in question. And I think part of what Schopenhauer is saying here is that our, our will is moved by imagination, by pictures, by desirable things, not by abstractions, by principles, by thoughts alone. So he'll elaborate in what follows. He continues. In one of Voltaire's or Diderot's romances, I forget the precise reference, the hero, standing like a young Hercules at the parting of the ways, can see no other representation of virtue than his old tutor holding a snuff box in his left hand, from which he takes a pinch and moralizes, whilst vice appears in the shape of his mother's chambermaid. It is in youth more especially that the goal of our efforts comes to be a fanciful picture of happiness, which continues to hover before our eyes, sometimes for half and even for the whole of our life, a sort of mocking spirit. For when we think our dream is to be realized, the picture fades away. 
leaving us the knowledge that nothing of what it promised is actually accomplished. How often this is so with the visions of domesticity, the detailed picture of what our home will be like, or of life among our fellow citizens and in society, or again, of living in the country, the kind of house we shall have, its surroundings, the marks of honor and respect that will be paid to us, and so on, whatever our hobby may be, chaque fois sa marole. I think a French proverb meaning roughly, to each his own, or it takes all sorts to make a world. It is often the same too with our dreams about one we love. And this is all quite natural, for the visions we conjure up affect us directly, as though they were real objects, and so they exercise a more immediate influence upon our will than an abstract idea, which gives merely a vague general outline devoid of details. And the details are just the real part of it. We can be only indirectly affected by an abstract idea, and yet it is the abstract idea alone which will do as much as it promises. And it is the function of education to teach us to put our trust in it. Of course, the abstract idea must be occasionally explained, paraphrased as it were, by the aid of pictures, but discreetly, cum grano salis, that is, with, with a grain of salt. That's the end of the section. An interesting reflection here from Schopenhauer on the hazards of the imagination. Right? We face a danger in youth especially, but perhaps for some of us our whole life long, of chasing after the phantom of the beautiful life, which we imagine in such vivid detail that it just draws us towards it. Right? I'll have this kind of relationship, this kind of pleasant experiences, this kind of house. And those details, although they are imaginary, because they are so these vivid sensual details they're they're real as dirt they they will they will draw us directly to it where the idea uh, as a pure idea requires a great deal of education and training to get us to understand and to move our will towards the, the great example he cites from the uh, fr from the the book about the the man who's Virtue is represented by the old tutor, right? Not an attractive image, right? An old man taking snuff and this sort of pontificating about virtue. Whereas what's vice look like? Ah, vice, she's beautiful, right? She's very sensual. She's a particular woman that perhaps he's had this desire for. So there, it's not easy to, it's, it's not difficult to see just where the weight of the will will come down when faced with those levels of details. The last thing I might add here, just by way of comment, uh, is his remark that this is in fact natural, that, that we are moved by details and less so by principles until we have acquired a great deal of education and effort. I think of this of an observation that somebody made to me a while ago about the nature of political rhetoric. The, the strategy of political rhetoric is, in, in election time, is to render all of the benefits of my favored policy in terms of very vivid, concrete details. This person who's just like you will have this much money to do this thing if we implement my policy. And it's to render the benefits of my opponent's policy, the policy that I oppose, in broad generalities, right? Well, they they just want to respect, you know, to, to, to pay off the rich or to respect such and such, to achieve some goal, some good, which I suppose, while it's good, will be represented by me in terms of some sort of vague general abstraction, which doesn't really move the will, doesn't draw you towards it. If I had to give a picture of it at all, I'd give a picture of the old tutor with the snuff box, not of the, the sensuous chambermaid uh, as an object of desire. So that's section 18 of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. We'll look at section 19 in the next video. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye. In section 19 of Councils and Maxims, Schopenhauer generalizes the rule that he articulated in section 18. Here's what he writes. The preceding rule may be taken as a special case of the more general maxim that a man should never let himself be mastered by the impressions of the moment, or indeed by outward appearances at all, which are incomparably more powerful in their effects than the mere play of thought or a train of ideas, not because these momentary impressions are rich in virtue of the data they supply, it is often just the contrary, 
but because they are something palpable to the senses and direct in their working. They forcibly invade our mind, disturbing our repose and shattering our resolutions. It is easy to understand that the thing which lies before our very eyes will produce the whole of its effect at once, but that time and leisure are necessary for the working of thought and the appreciation of argument, as it is impossible to think of everything at one and the same moment. This is why we are so allured by pleasure, in spite of all our determination to resist it, or so much annoyed by a criticism, even though we know that its author is totally incompetent to judge, or so irritated by an insult, though it comes from some very contemptible quarter. In the same way, to mention no other instances, ten reasons for thinking that there is no danger may be outweighed by one mistaken notion that is actually at hand. All this shows the radical unreason of human nature. Women frequently succumb altogether to this predominating influence of present impressions, and there are few men so overweighted with reason as to escape suffering from a similar fate. That's the first half of section 19. Uh, Schopenhauer, continuing this distinction between the influence of the senses and of the concrete immediate thing in front of us, the, uh, the chambermaid from the previous section, and the work of thought. And the, the indication here is that by our very nature, we are irrational. We take a, we have a strong draw and preference towards what is concrete, what is sensible, what is in front of us, because it offers all of its good at, at one moment. We can see all the benefit, all the effect of it right there in front of us. The working of thought requires time to understand and time to grasp. It is going to be the, the work of a much more mature and civilized uh, and well-governed self. So there's the sort of nature that's built in. Schopenhauer continues. If it is impossible to resist the effects of some external influence by the mere play of thought, the best thing to do is to neutralize it by some contrary influence. For example, the effect of an insult may be overcome by seeking the society of those who have a good opinion of us. And the unpleasant sensation of Im imminent danger may be avoided by fixing our attention on the means of warding it off. Leibniz tells of an Italian who managed to bear up under the tortures of the rack by never for a moment ceasing to think of the gallows which would have awaited him had he revealed his secret. He kept crying out, I see it, I see it, afterwards explaining that this was part of his plan. It is from some such reason as this that we find it so difficult to stand alone in a matter of opinion, not to be made irresolute by the fact that everyone else disagrees with us and acts accordingly even though we are quite sure that they are in the wrong. Take the case of a fugitive king who is trying to avoid capture. How much consolation he must find in the ceremonious and submissive attitude of a faithful follower exhibited secretly so as not to betray his master's strict incognito. It must be almost necessary to prevent him doubting his own existence. That's the end of section 19. Two really interesting points here, I think, in these final paragraphs. First, that essentially, given that we recognize the irrationality of our nature and our inclination to overvalue the immediate and the sensible and the pleasant over the work of uh, the hard work of thought and uh, discipline and philosophy, we ought to try to beat the senses at their own game. If we know that we will take offense at an insult, no matter how ungrounded, we should then try to surround ourselves with people who will, um, who will bring us, who will pull us, pull our nature in the contrary direction. And then this last paragraph, really fascinating to me in an era of social media, uh, he says this explains why we are so, we find it so difficult, even when we're certain we are right, to bear up under the social pressure of everyone else thinking otherwise. It's because of this irrational, natural inclination we have to overvalue what is immediate, what is concrete, what is right in front of us, which here would be the opposition of the masses, and to undervalue relative to its, its true 
worth the, uh, the value of thought and of truth and of our reasoned conclusions. So uh, the, the image of the fugitive king who requires really kind of psychologically in order to, to function, requires the, the secretly given, hidden um, honors given to him by the one retainer traveling with him who knows his, his royal status. Very, very uh, interesting, I think, and powerful image to carry forward for the lessons of section 19. So that's the end of section 19. Section 20 is the last section of chapter two. We'll look at that in the next video. Thanks for watching today. Bye. Section 20 of Schopenhauer's Counsels and Maxims is the final section of chapter two on our relation to ourselves. I think you'll find that it starts out a little bit odd with a discussion of physical exercise, but it finishes strong. I think you'll really enjoy it. Here's what Schopenhauer writes. In the first part of this work, I have insisted upon the great value of health as the chief and most important element in happiness. Let me emphasize and confirm what I have there said by giving a few general rules as to its preservation. The way to harden the body is to impose a great deal of labor and effort upon it in the days of good health, to exercise it both as a whole and in its several parts, and to habituate it to withstand all kinds of noxious influences. But on the appearance of any illness or disorder, either in the body as a whole or in any of its parts, a contrary course should be taken and every means used to nurse the body, or the part of it which is affected, and to spare it any effort, for what is ailing and debilitated cannot be hardened. The muscles may be strengthened by a vigorous use of them, but not so the nerves, they are weakened by it. Therefore, while exercising the muscles in every way that is suitable, care should be taken to spare the nerves as much as possible. The eyes, for instance, should be protected from too strong a light, especially when it is reflected light, from any straining of them in the dark, and from the long-continued examination of minute objects, and the ears from too loud sounds. Above all, the brain should never be forced or used too much or at the wrong time. Let it have a rest during digestion. For then, the same vital energy which forms thoughts in the brain has a great deal of work to do elsewhere. I mean, in the digestive organs, where it prepares chyme and chyle. For similar reasons, the brain should never be used during or immediately after violent muscular exercise. For the motor nerves are, in this respect, on a par with the sensory nerves. The pain felt when a limb is wounded has its seat in the brain. And in the same way, it is not really our legs and arms which work and move. It is the brain, or more strictly, that part of it which, through the medium of the spine, excites the nerves in the limbs and sets them in motion. Accordingly, when our arms and legs feel tired, the true seat of this feeling is in the brain. This is why it is only in connection with those muscles which are set in motion consciously and voluntarily, in other words, depend for their action upon the brain, that any feeling of fatigue can arise. This is not the case with those muscles which work involuntarily, like the heart. It is obvious, then, that injury is done to the brain if violent muscular exercise and intellectual exertion are forced upon it at the same moment, or at very short intervals. I'll pause here about halfway through section 20 to just post a little bit of incredulity. I'm not certain that this t advice holds up, although it is very revealing of Schopenhauer's attitude towards a practical philosophy, something that unites an account of the body, the brain, the mind, as we'll see in, in, what, he, in what follows. Back to Schopenhauer. What I say stands in no contradiction with the fact that at the beginning of a walk, or at any period of a short stroll, there often comes a feeling of enhanced intellectual vigor. The parts of the brain that come into play 
have had no time to become tired. And besides, slight muscular exercise conduces to activity of the respiratory organs and causes a purer and more oxidated supply of arterial blood to mount to the brain. It is most important to allow the brain the full measure of sleep, which is necessary to restore it. For sleep is to a man's whole nature what winding up is to a clock. This measure will vary directly with the development and activity of the brain. To overstep the measure is mere waste of time, because if that is done, sleep gains only so much in length as it loses in depth. And here Schopenhauer adds an, an interesting footnote, which I'll read to you. Here's the footnote. Sleep is a morsel of death borrowed to keep up and renew the part of life which is exhausted by the day. Le sommeil est un emprunt fait à la mort. Or it might be said that sleep is the interest we have to pay on the capital which is called in at death. And the higher the rate of interest, and the more regular, regularly it is paid, the further the date of redemption is postponed. Okay, I have to say, I, I love that footnote, the image, the, the image of sleep as interest we pay on the capital of our lives. The, the more we pay as we go along, the more we sleep, the longer we can postpone the redemption date of our death. Contrarywise, the less we sleep, the more we economize on sleep here, the less interest we're paying, the sooner the loan will be called in, that our death arrives more quickly. I think that's a great image, regardless whether we, we agree with the practical advice or not. Back to the main text of Schopenhauer. It should be clearly understood that thought is nothing but the organic function of the brain. And it has to obey the same laws in regard to exertion and repose as any other organic function. The brain can be ruined by overstrain, just like the eyes. As the function of the stomach is to digest, so it is that, that of the brain to think. The notion of a soul as something elementary and immaterial, merely lodging in the brain and need, needing nothing at all for the performance of its essential function, which consists in always and unweariedly thinking, has undoubtedly driven many people to foolish practices, leading to a deadening of the intellectual powers. Frederick the Great, even, once tried to form the habit of doing without sleep altogether. It would be well if professors of philosophy refrained from giving currency to a notion which is attended by practical results of a pernicious character. But then this is just what professorial philosophy does in its old womanish endeavor to keep on good terms with the catechism. A man should accustom himself to view his intellectual capacities in no other light than that of physiological functions, and to manage them accordingly, nursing or exercising them as the case may be, remembering that every kind of physical suffering, malady, or disorder in whatever part of the body it occurs has its effect upon the mind. The best advice I know on this subject is given by Cabanis in his Rapport du Physique et du Moral de l'Homme. Through neglect of this rule, many men of genius and great scholars have become weak-minded and childish, or even gone quite mad as they grew old. To take no other instances, there can be no doubt that the celebrated English poets of the early part of this century, Scott, Wordsworth, Southey, became intellectually dull and incapable towards the end of their days, nay, soon after passing their 60th year, and that their imbecility can be traced to the fact that, at that period of life, they were all led on, by the promise of high pay, to treat literature as a trade and to write for money. This seduced them into an unnatural abuse of their intellectual powers, and a man who puts his pegasus into harness and urges on his muse with the whip, will have to pay a penalty similar to that which is exacted by the abuse of other kinds of power. And even in the case of Kant, I suspect that the second childhood of his last four years was due to overwork in later life, 
and after he had succeeded in becoming a famous man. Every month of the year has its own peculiar and direct influence upon health and bodily condition generally, nay, even upon the state of the mind. It is an influence dependent upon the weather. That's the end of section 20 and the end of chapter 2 of Councils and Maxims. I think some real Schopenhauerian style here, first with the condemnation of the sort of Cartesian idea of the ghost in the machine, the soul that somehow is not physiological and so doesn't depend upon the body. Schopenhauer insisting here, I think correctly, that everything in the body affects the mind and the mind required, the brain certainly requires a certain amount of uh, care as, as a bodily organ. Um, and then this uh, uh, fantastic uh, snarling at the professors of philosophy, encouraging a notion which leads, which is attended by practical results of a pernicious character. Okay, we, we would please beg the philosophers of our time to stop ruining people's lives, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, Schopenhauer says. So I think this has been an interesting conclusion to this chapter on our relation to ourselves. We'll break into section 21 and the next chapter on our relation to others in another video. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.